and your family stay safe. Barbecue season. Yes. There's a lot of things you have to consider, even just preparing your grill for the summer season. It's wild, Dylan. The National Fire Protection Agency says July is the biggest month for grilling fires. It is a serious danger. It sends four to 5,000 people to the ER every mm. year. So you just want to be safe. Number one, have a fire extinguisher on hand. You don't think about it. I don't have one. You, right? Yeah. You should have it right there by the grill because you're literally dealing with an open flame <laughs> and know how to use it. The last time you want to start reading those directions is when like an actual it, fire yes, is happening. Exactly. Three foot safety zone around the grill just make sure nothing flammable the patio furniture is pushed away and then cleaning your grill after every use is important and we'll come over here and talk about yes, some of the tools because you can i'm use. actually you know if i look at my grill there are little metal bristles I know. all over it so the experts say those metal bristle brushes get rid of them because mm -hmm. the bristles come off and they can get stuck within the food when you're cooking there's Scary. a viral TikTok going around right mm -hmm. now of I've an er it. doctor yeah showing this little boy ate a hamburger oh, and no. got a little bristle stuck in the back oh. of his throat it took a long time for them to figure, figure out, what, out what, it was, what it was and it was really hurting him. Mm -hmm. So stick with something like this. This is a wooden grill cleaner, mm -hmm. which you know you can use. It's got the handle. You want to go low tech, just ball up some foil after the mm -hmm. grill is hot. You scrub all the little pieces off. It's also helpful for food safety, right? Because you don't want leftover mm -hmm. bits of food for the next time you're True. eating. You can also use an onion. The acids in the onion help break up really? all of those nasty grill bits. Get all bits. that nasty bit. Yes, exactly. Okay. Great. Uh, Vic, let's talk about yeah. water safety. Those are always, honestly, the most awful stories that we always hear about people who have distressed swimming or drowning. Um, you got some tips. Yeah, Jacob. Actually, according to the CDC, drowning is the leading cause of accidental death among children. The leading cause. And black children, five times more likely to die than white children. So the message here and every single day around water, watch your children around water. Never assume that someone else is watching them. Always assign an adult, a sober person. If you're having a party, consider or hiring a lifeguard. The other thing is get those kids into swim lessons, lessons yep. right? They're 88% less likely to drown if they have some swimming and water safety My skills. My daughter's doing it right now. Oh, how old is she? Three. Perfect. Oh, wow. You go to the YMCA, the Red Cross, or your local swim school, get them involved. The other thing is invest in a life jacket over the floaties. So the floaties sort of give people a sense, a false, like a sense, false of sense of security. Right? That's Let's what the swim teacher was saying. So these. this is a better kind of uh, life preserver to have. Exactly. And this one, just so you can see, you can check to make sure it's actually a approved by the U.S. Coast Guard. You see that little label right there? USCG USCG. approved. Exactly. Okay. This is going to keep them in the right position in the water as well. And if you are an adult swimming, always take a buddy or let someone know, hey, I'm going to be out here in the ocean. This is what I'm doing. This is when you can expect me to come back. That way someone's looking out for you. And then the age old advice about if you get caught in a rip current, which can happen. Diagonal swim, right? Swim parallel to the shore. Oh, to the because shore. Because the rip current can so be as you, wide as 100 feet. Yeah. Parallel. Diagonal, you'll be struggling. See, look, you learn something new every day. Don't yes. listen to me, listen to her. <laughs> and Thank now you, I'm fired. Bye. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, oh yeah, we're going For here. For people who we're have a here. certain amount of extra exposure, mm -hmm. this is very important. Harry, our skin is the biggest organ on our body. So if you are going out in the sun, avoid the hours of 10 to 4. That's when the sun is most intense. Wear a wide brimmed hat, cover up with clothing. And if you do want to get a little bit of sun, still slather on the SPF. You're looking at a golf ball size or the amount that would fit into a, a shot glass to cover your body. Now, here's the thing. There's so many kinds of SPF, oh. right? Broad spectrum, UVA, UVB. You want broad spectrum, and that means it's protecting against UVA, A for aging and skin cancer, mm -hmm. and UVB, B for burning. And that's not the technical term, no, but that's I know, how but I remember it. that's a good way to think about wow. it. Yes. And don't forget your eyes. Wrap around sunglasses that block 99% of the UV rays. Here's the other thing I want you to remember. Sunscreen is water resistant. It's never waterproof. And you want to look and see, is it 40 minutes? Is it 80 minutes? Set a timer on your phone just to remind yourself to reapply. That's really important. Or just do it several times. Yeah. You don't want to get if burned. If you're in and out of the water. Right, yeah. especially, or if you're sweating, because mm -hmm. that will take the sunscreen off. But you want to remember every sunburn that you get, there is research that shows that increases your risk of getting skin cancer later on in life. Once so I, I heard that, I felt guilty, because I like the sun look. Yes, you know I, mean? I know, it's we not do. Worth, it's not worth getting sick. No, not at all. Right, last but not least, let's talk about preventing bites. So important. Okay, so you want to use a, an insect repellent that has at least 20% to 30% DEET. There are natural repellents out there. People say, you know, for some people it works, for others you really need the DEET. You can spray it onto your clothing as well as onto your skin. Mm -hmm. And we're not just talking about protecting you from bites from mosquitoes and ticks. Mm -hmm. For the itchy factor, you want to prevent diseases like yeah. West Nile virus, Zika, which is carried by mosquitoes, or Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Lyme disease, mm -hmm. which is carried by ticks. So make sure you use it. And you really have to do self-examination for right. ticks. Go. Check Everywhere. all the the nooks and crannies. Just mm -hmm. do. Right? right. No, I, well. The tick expert. That is professional advice. <laughs>
Up next, if you are still planning your summer vacation, we have apps that can save you time and money. Plus, thinking about traveling with your pet, what you need to know to make your trip as smooth as possible. That's all ahead on Consumer Confidential. We're back with more Consumer Confidential. Summer is considered to be the busiest travel season. From gas prices to airline tickets, the costs can quickly add up. Check out these travel apps that can help you get the most out of your vacation without breaking the bank. <laughs> okay, so gas, flights, everything's up. Mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, what do you recommend if you're planning your trip this, this summer as okay. far as transportation. Let's go with all the apps that are going to help you save the most money. We've all heard of Expedia. They bundle all sorts of things, hotels, car rentals, airfare. So that's a great way to get a savings. Hopper is one that you can look at and they'll give you the best times to buy. But I'm going to tell you from all the interviews we've done, buy as soon as you know where yeah. you want to go. If you don't know where you want to go, skyscanner.com and airfarewatchdog.com. These mm -hmm. are great. You sign up for alerts. You put in the airports that are closest to you. And then one or two times a week, you get an alert. You can go to Vegas for 99 bucks. Right. That might help you determine your next trip. And finally, if price is all that matters to you, yeah. you go to Kayak and you say, this is how much I'm willing to spend. This is how far I'm willing to go. And Kayak will narrow it down for you worldwide and say, hey, these are the destinations to consider. Before we go to the gas thing, yeah. I want to ask you, if you use these like third-party apps right. and you have to try to get a refund, how difficult is it? It can be difficult, very, because you're, especially if you're bundling something together. So what you want to do is use these as a price point starting and then look at the individual hotels and airlines to see, hey, does it make sense to bundle or am I better off booking directly, which would be easier to cancel. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're going to jump in a car and drive. Yes. Gas prices. Okay, so first you want to know where the cheapest gas is. So Gas Guru, Google Maps, those are places that will tell you, okay, these are the best spots to fill up. Mm -hmm. Then once you get to your spot, I want you to really get those gas station apps. They're free to sign up. I was at a BP. It was, you know, a guy across from me said, hey, I'm using this. Look, I'm paying five cents less per gallon than you are. Completely legitimate. Another one is getupside.com. That is an app that you can stack on top of the gas station app and gives you cash back. So all those pennies really add up. Okay, now, if we want to travel, mm -hmm. people, you know, it's old school, the old travel agent. Yeah. What, 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 as we're now in the 21st century, what do we do? So here's the thing. Travel agents are wonderful and can get you great deals on those big trips, the trips of a lifetime, or you're going international, or you and I are traveling, so we've got multiple stops, your family, my family. They help you coordinate. If you're just taking a road trip, try Road Trippers. This is a fantastic app. It really helps you to plan an entire trip and tell you how to get off the beaten path, iconic stops, landmarks, and things that you can do. AAA has one called Trip Tick, which is They used is to have a, a, a 
physical map. Oh, yeah. I you know. Used to, the trip tick. Exactly. And you go and they, they mark it, but now it's digital. Now it's all digital, which is cool. And Al, for bicycling, you can actually plan a bicycling route oh, wow. as well. I mean, you probably aren't going to do like the 400 mile Yellowstone yeah. and the Grand Tetons, but maybe you want to do something down the coast. This uh -huh. is a great way. Uh -huh. All right. All we've right. got about, what, two minutes left? Let's okay, talk let's about lodging it. really quickly okay. and hotels and what you need They're to know. They're up 30% year over year. So Goodness. hotels are expensive, Chanel. Okay. Bundling is a great way to save, but like Al was saying, it can be tough to unbundle. So you mm -hmm. want to be sure that's where you want to go. Okay. Hoteltonight.com will help you book last minute hotel nights. If you're not, if you don't care about the specific place you're going to go, right, you right. just need a place to stay. That's non-refundable, but you're going to get a great deal. Mm -hmm. And then finally, of course, you've got Airbnb and Verbo, which can offer really great deals, but book as far in advance as you can. I've done all three of these things. Yeah. All right, last but not least, a lot of people like to try international and they're yes. ready to fly internationally. Anything we need to know? Oh, let's talk about the oh, camping Oh, wait, the camping, first. yes. This camping. is important. Yes, yes. Everybody's camping. The dirt is very cool. You'll find 44,000 different places really? I've to stay. Heard of it. There okay. will be photos and user reviews about these campsites. Hip Camp is similar, but Chanel, if you want to camp with llamas or you want to do goat yoga where you the little goats like jump on your back, Hip Camp will help you That's say, fine. you want to forage for mushrooms, they'll help you find those oh, kinds I love of campsites. That. Yes. Recreation.gov, fantastic site. We have 423 national Ooh, park sites. Nice. Not only will this give you real-time updates that's on where good. the long lines are, if there's road closures, if there's weather, it will also give you maps that you can download. Mm -hmm. So when you're out in remote areas, you don't have cell phone coverage, you can still loss. use the maps. That is so good. Yeah, <laughs> Time Shifter will help you adjust to jet lag. Okay. You plug in all your stats oh. and it'll say, hey, here's the schedule for you in this country. This is when that's you should fun. sleep, this is when you should eat. Google Translate, lifesaver, Life yeah. right? Yeah. It'll, it'll do menus for you. You can actually scan a menu and then it'll tell Wait, you what really? you need to Wait, really? I thought it was just yeah. you talk and then you just no, you can actually Whoa. hold it up on the, onto the menu, and it will translate. Scan the wow. file. Wow. Exactly. This Super was good, helpful. Vicky. Traveling with family and friends is always fun, but sometimes it can be hard to leave your pet behind. Taking them with you, well, that can seem like a fun and simple idea, but did you know there's more to pack than just a leash and a water bowl? Here's your pet travel checklist. So first things first, we want to make sure our pets are safe when we travel. How do we do that? Yes, the number one thing is there's so many of us, 78% of Americans will travel with their pets at some point during the year. And there are 90 million U.S. households that have a pet, according wow. to the American Pet Products Association. It. Right. So as Al says, if you're traveling with your pet, it's not a vacation. Probably more like a family trip. I feel yes. the same way about traveling with kids. Not a vacation, family trip. <laughs> but the first thing you want to do is take your pet to the vet at least a couple months mm. before your planned date of travel because you want to make sure all the vaccinations are up to speed and get a hold of that health record in case you're going going out of country or somewhere where they're going to ask you for a mm. rabies certification mm. or proof of vaccination. Then always have a secure collar on your pet and make sure that information is up to date. If you've changed your phone number or changed your address, you want to make sure that's current. Look up the list of emergency animal hospitals just to have it on hand. Put it in a note on your phone. The last thing you want to do is be somewhere remote and not know how to get health care for your pet. And then you think about the weather where you're traveling. Mm -hmm. Try to avoid extreme heat. And here's another thing. If you're driving with your pet, never leave them in the car. Yeah. Even for hot. a minute, quick. it yep. gets hot quick. Exactly. Pets die that way. Mm -hmm. Also, pet theft is a thing. Mm -hmm. If you've got one of those breeds what? that people like, yeah, oh, sure. they are not oh, above oh, yeah. stealing your pet. Absolutely. Wow. Now, so you're, you're going to get ready to travel. And just like for us, we have checklists for what we need to pack. Yeah. Same thing for your pet. Absolutely. So in addition to that secure collar, you want to bring at least one leash, if not a couple. You might be used to having your dog off leash, Bosco, running around mm -hmm. in your home environment. The last thing you want to do is go on vacation and lose your dog in the mountains yeah. of Colorado. Right. The next thing, think about their food, keep it familiar, pack enough, and also a portable water dish and a food dish. Because you're going hiking, you're going outside, right. never underestimate how much water your pet needs. Mm -hmm. Same thing, what goes in comes out. So bring those compostable <laughs> waste bags, yep. a litter box. And then when it comes to the medication for your pet, you might be going somewhere where there are fleas and ticks. Ask your veterinarian for some of that medicine that oh. will help keep those bugs off of your animal. And always bring their, their toys that are their favorites and their mm. familiar blankies. It just helps them to adjust. Also check yeah. the carrier, because we, we were tra traveling with Pepper and she had outgrown her carrier oh. that we had oh, originally. Wow. It was like, uh-oh, oh, there's a little squeeze tight squeeze. Oh. Very good to keep them secure too in the car. People think just let your dog run around or your cat, whatever. They actually have these restraints and little seat belts for your pets oh with a harness. Mm -hmm. It's safer for you as the driver and for the animal. So wait, how much? <laughs> what about 
cost? Right. Like, do you have to buy a ticket? Like, I don't even know how that works. So if you are going to fly with your pet, first thing, go to the USDA's APHIS website. That stands for Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. And they actually have a great checklist for what kind of pets are allowed into the country, out of the country, kind of the requirements and a checklist there. A ferret is a pet. A pheasant is poultry. So they're oh, in two no. different <laughs> categories. If you've got a pheasant that you're traveling with, you've got problems. You know what, though? Remember people were traveling with those oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, the service animals. animal scam. And then what scam. do you do? Leave them at security? I mean, you got to... Well, the best thing question. to do is drive. Obviously, if you have an animal that's too big to fit into the cabin of the plane, I think most pet experts and veterinarians agree. You really don't want to fly them in cargo, especially yeah. during the summer. Anything can happen. You don't have eyes on them. Every airline, you know, has different rules, so just make sure you're aware and make sure that you test the carrier ahead of time and put little treats in there so your pet gets used to being in a carrier. Mm. If you have a dog or cat and prefer to board your pet while you're on vacation, the American Kennel Club says it's important to find the right boarding facility for your pet. Visit the kennel first in person. Ask about their immunization requirements. And while you're there, check to see if the spaces are clean, secure, and temperature controlled. And if you're not comfortable leaving your pet at a kennel, consider a family member, friend, or a professional pet sitter. If you are hiring someone, make sure you ask about their past experiences check their references, and watch how they interact with your pet. All right, coming up, a roadmap to saving this summer. We'll reveal the top deals and tell you the best time to buy. And later, we'll break down the most popular side hustles to help you earn some extra money. We're back right after this. Welcome back to Consumer Confidential. Inflation still has many Americans watching what they spend, but you don't have to skimp on summer essentials. There are some simple ways you can start saving right now. Sometimes we like to do a macro view of this. So is this going to be a summer of savings? Is it possible? Look, inflation is still certainly on yeah. everyone's minds, Hoda. We want to save. We certainly want to save during summer. So let's get started. If you want some tools, gadgets, this is the time to go to Lowe's, Home Depot, Sears to look for those items. Okay. Sun's out, guns out, Hoda. <laughs> guns uh, out? Guns out. Your, yes. These guns, these guns. Your athletic apparel, yeah. shoes, socks, sports bras, all of your favorite athletic brands shop now. Athleta, Nike, Puma, Reebok, Adidas. They're going to have deals because people want to get outside and get Okay. Fit. You don't think about this, but first aid supplies. Oh. You get out there, you've got cuts, bruises, bug bites. This is a good time to refresh that first aid supply kit you have in your car and okay. your home. And Bath and Body Works has what they call their queen of sales, up to 75% off of lotions and potions mm -hmm. right now. Body Shop as well. Don't forget about your pets, not just the four-legged ones. Chewy has a huge blue box sale up to 
50% off of pet supplies for hamsters, guinea pigs, farm animals even. So are there ways, like what's the way to save other than knowing that these are some good ideas? Those are good places to yeah. go. I want you to think about store brands, especially yeah. when it comes to sunscreen and bug repellent. Okay. Here's the thing, as long as you have the active ingredients to protect you against UVA for aging and UVB for burning, yeah. broad spectrum sunscreen, the store brands are perfectly fine. Same with repellent, look for something that has DEET. And when it comes to food, Consumer Reports is constantly doing testing. They say the quality and taste of store brands is great and you can save a lot that way. Mm -hmm. When you go to the store, look yep. for those manager markdowns, especially on meat. This is the, the items that are getting close to their best if used by mm -hmm. date. Sometimes those are 50% off and meat's a really expensive part How of your How close to budget. that? Like, it, let's say the expiration date is tomorrow. Can you go a day or two past that? Absolutely, if it says best buy. Buy, right? yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's a very tricky thing with the USDA and the FDA because it's difficult to say what is the absolute expiration date of something. Sure. Best buy date, you can absolutely go over a little bit. So you can hug sure. that date that or go past it. the highest it. quality, freshest, but you can certainly still eat it. Okay. Um, your rewards programs, anywhere that you're shopping loyally, you do want to look and see if they have a pro program that gives you points. Mm -hmm. Ibotta, I-B-O-T-T-A. Is this I want another you to one of those? This app. It's another okay. one of those. Wait, say it again. I bought a. I B O T T A. And what? Yes. Okay, so what do I do when I get the app? You buy your groceries, you get the app, you take a picture of your receipt, and there are certain items you will get a full rebate on. Wait, we talk what? about it during Thanksgiving because often you can get a full Thanksgiving meal for free. You buy it, you take a picture, they send you a check for the full amount. Okay. Also, the grocery store apps, these can be annoying, but if you shop through them, a lot of times there are digital coupons that are only available in the app. Worth the savings. Let's get grilling. Okay, so the best time to buy a grill is towards the end mm -hmm. of December. But okay. let's say you need one now. Right. You can go to the store and see if they have floor models that are on sale. Oh, that's good. Check secondhand websites like OfferUp.com or okay. Facebook Marketplace. That's another good place. Mm -hmm. Online liquidator Overstock.com has sales on grills as well. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, you want to wait till the end of the summer if you can. Okay. And when it comes to pool toys. Remember, yeah. these aren't items that are meant to be passed on for generations. So you can go to Dollar Tree <laughs> or Dollar General and look for those items there. Arka, do we have some items that maybe we should avoid buying at this point? It sounds so counterintuitive, What should Hoda, we buy? Right. But you should avoid summer clothes and swimsuits right because now. Because why? Because they're going to go on sale yeah, in yeah. August when everybody's trying to make room for their fall inventory. But here's the thing. You're like, I need a cute dress right now for now. a summer barbecue. Try this app. Retail expert Rachel Warch says it's called Benny. B-E-N-I. Okay. It's scours all kinds of second-hand e sales okay. for brand name items for really good prices. Okay. So try that. Of course, your neighborhood thrift store, consignment store is a great place to get cute summer clothes as well. Okay, you want to wait on air conditioners. Mm. You miss the sales in May. If you can wait August and September, they'll go on sale again. Same with patio furniture. This is like the grills. Wait till the mm -hmm. end of the summer. Best deals, less selection. And finally, Amazon Prime Day for electronics. That's coming up the second week of July. Sure. Wait till back to school if you're getting a computer or a laptop. It's a good way. So we should plan ahead for next year. Next yeah. year, we're going to start buying at the right time. Okay. All right. And remember, only buy items if you can afford them. Don't go into debt just because you see a deal. And while it may be tempting to use that buy now, pay later option, don't miss any of those payments or you could face penalties. And lastly, make sure you read the return policy for every store before making any purchases. So the comment, do you want to earn some extra money? We will share the side hustles that are worth trying that are perfect for summer when Consumer Confidential returns.
Welcome back. Summer is in full swing and the season brings new opportunities to earn some extra cash. If you find yourself with some free time, consider starting a side hustle. These days, social media is filled with creative ways to boost your income, and we broke down the best ideas. Let's define side hustle first. Okay, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a job on the side of your normal main hustle, your main job, and a lot of people are doing it. Bankrate just did a survey and found 39% of Americans have some sort of side hustle, and of that, 44% of them say they're likely to keep it because of inflation and what else. The most common side hustles, delivery driving, grocery it. deliveries, mm -hmm. ride shares, also filling out online surveys, taking part in focus groups, and reselling things. You can make Whoa. that much money? You can make about $810 on average. Wow. wow. Yeah. I would assume that the summer provides some unique opportunities for side hustling. Yes, Craig. So first of all, a lot of people are going to be revenge traveling this summer, right? Mm -hmm. Pets up demand. Yes. Everybody's going to be out. They can't take their pets with them. So any kind of pet sitting, dog walking. There's a service called Meowtel, which can hook you up if you're really into cats. They do a whole screening. It's a 60-day trial. But there are services in addition to just posting on your neighbor group to say, hey, I'm available. The other thing is rentals. We all know about Verbo and Airbnb mm -hmm. if you're lucky enough to have an entire house that sure. you can rent out. Swimply for pools, that's actually really taking off. People love to be able to rent a backyard pool for a birthday party or something yeah. like that. But also clothing. So there are a couple places called, uh, let's see, what, what are they? Rotate Your Closet, uh -huh. uh, Clothing Cycle, Toolery as well, where you can actually rent your own outfit. Let's say you bought some nice things for special occasions. What? You've worn them once. Yeah, I know, but apparently no, but people are doing a gown. It. Let's say a beautiful a gown. gown. You spend a couple hundred bucks on this gown, or and you, thousands of or dollars. Thousands people of dollars, do, quite right? frankly, that's being nice. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, well, actually, no, no that's seriously, it back that's now. where you no, you guys are wrong. Cycle is one of them. I know. 100%. I'm curious about it myself. It's yeah. fairly new, but people are doing it. Absolutely, multiple services. So look that Gowns, up. And then yes. finally, Al, you were talking about laundry. So if you want to drive, deliver, and pick up people's laundry. Oh, Jen Jolly, also a friend a of the idea. third hour, mm -hmm. she recommends a service called Poplin, and there's another one called Laundry Care. So a lot of these, oh, and baby equipment. This is a big one. I oh. have not thought about this. Baby Quip. So if you have cribs, yep. strollers, mm -hmm. pack in place, people travel, they have their babies with them. They're not going to bring all that stuff. A if you've got idea. a car big enough to rent some of those things out, oh, apparently you that. can make a fair amount of money a month doing it. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you. What are the tax implications for that? That's the main thing you want to consider. So taxes are important. Death and taxes are the only two things we can't avoid, right? Yep. So anything over $400, you will have to pay federal taxes on. So you want to really make sure that you're keeping track of your side hustle mm -hmm. income. Now, what about if you want to, maybe a lot of people, as you mentioned, rent out your house, things like that. Yeah. There are local laws and things you got to worry about. Right? Yeah, we just had a little graphic on there about laws and regulations and permits. And that is so important because in New York City, for example, if you want to do an Airbnb, you got to get it registered with the city and you have have to reside there. So it, you can't just Good. buy a bunch of different yeah. places and then rent, and them, rent out. them out. You really want to check and it's very much based on not just your state or your county, but even your municipality. When it comes to insurance and permits, well, if you're renting out a pool, you can think lots of things could happen, right? Sure. Swimply offers a million dollar policy, $10,000 if there's property damage, but you need to check with your HOA. If yeah, there are a lot, of a lot of property owners are, are pushing back on Yes, this. complaining about noise yeah. and, you know, the crowds and parking. So that can be an issue in your neighborhood you want to know before you invest in this. And of course, what's the cost of maintenance? Are you cleaning mm -hmm. these places out? Are you hiring a service? How does that cut into potential earnings? Vic, I, we just did a segment a few minutes ago uh, and earlier this morning as well on the teenage job market this summer being the hottest perhaps ever. What are some things that these prospective job holders should keep in mind, these teens? Oh, well, it's the summer of teen jobs for sure. Pretty much if you are a teenager who wants to work, there will be a job for you, whether awesome. it's in food service, in retail. Summer camps are huge. It's a little late for that right now, mm -hmm. but there may still be some opportunities. But the wages, median wage right now, about $14. That's up from $11.50 wow. back in 2019. And the summer job availability for teenagers has increased every year from uh, 2021 till now. That's our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn.
When you think Texas, you think beef, brisket, and barbecue. But here in Austin, the state's capital, there's so much more than that. We've got folks and chefs from all around the world who are putting their mark on this city's culinary scene. And in fact, the spices and traditions that pay homage to their families are making Austin a hot food scene. It's really kind of this melting pot of different people, their culture, and their food. The creativity and, and the flavor that they put into the food is really artistry, right? It's really the diversity of food. Like, you can get some of everything here. So what keeps Austin weird and tasty? We're about to find out. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Austin is home to over 1,200 food trucks in food parks just like this one. But we're here for one specific truck. We're here for Tony's Jamaican, serving up fine Caribbean fare to Austin for more than 10 years. Meet food truck owner Tony Scott and his wife Kim. From humble beginnings in Kingston, Jamaica, Tony has made Austin his home since 2003, and he has always had a passion for flavorful food. When did you start cooking? How young were you? 10. Tony's mother, Hyacinth, taught her sons how to be self-sufficient, especially in the kitchen. So you learned from mom early on? Yes. What was it about cooking that you liked? I don't know, I like food at those days. <laughs> those skills learned during childhood would help Tony define his career. For nearly a decade, he worked a small beachside business, serving jerk chicken and drinks to tourists in Jamaica. But after 9-11, tourism to the island stalled. So Tony moved to the U.S. in search of better opportunities, eventually landing in Austin. With construction booming in the state capital, Tony quickly found a job as a painter, but it was his homemade lunches that reignited an idea. You're working, you're, you bring in Jamaican food that you made, some of your friends taste and say, where'd this I, come from? I, yes, I cook my own food, you know, and they was like, oh, you should, you know, open a restaurant. And it's been 10 years. 10 years now. The 60-year-old chef opened Tony's Jamaican food truck in March of 2012 and his wife, Kim, has been one of his biggest supporters since the very beginning. What was the first meal he cooked for you? Curry chicken and rice, and he invited me over, and once I had it, I didn't want to ask for more. You know how ladies are, we try to eat a little bit, maybe the salad kind of thing, don't want them to know that we that greedy. But it was so good, I asked for seconds. So when Tony says, I want to do a food truck, your reaction? I said, a what? <laughs> I said, a food what? And I knew nothing about food trucks or however, so it was just all his idea. I just followed along. He said he wanted to do something, he had a vision. I said, okay, let's try it. Despite high praise from friends and family for his grub, Tony's business wasn't exactly booming from the start. When you first opened up, was it successful right away? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I came out here 10 o'clock in the morning and I was all here until 3 o'clock the next morning. Mm -hmm. I make $37. Wow. And, you know, I was still happy when I go home and she was like, how much money do you make? And I was like, $37. And she break out laughing. <laughs> and I was like, don't worry about it. And next day I come and I make $50 something mm dollars -hmm. and the next day I make $80 something dollars and I say, okay, I'm seeing increase. Tony taking advantage of the South by Southwest crowds that flocked to Austin in early March. Shortly after the festival, his fledgling business got a big boost with a small write-up. Kim, what, what to you, what was the game changer? What, what put this place over the top? Wow. His presence and his dedication. Jerk chicken and hot sauce. Now, loyal customers are visiting this hotspot daily decked out with the colors and vibes of Jamaica. From curried chicken and goat to jerk everything, food fans walk away feeling the island love. In 2018, 
Tony laid down more permanent roots in Texas. You opened up a brick and mortar restaurant. Were you nervous about that? A little bit. It was well, a little bit. Let me, Kim, were you nervous? Oh, about yeah, that? I'm so glad you asked me that question. Yes, I was. It was something totally different and from a food truck going into a brick and mortar. I didn't come from the restaurant industry. I came from the finance side. Coming in, I was like, I was telling Tony, I said, I got this, you know, I can run this, no problem. But oh, no, 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 no. I was ringing the, the red light bell, like, hey, I need some help. It was challenging, but also it was fun. Kim now helping run the business for both locations. Family always mean a lot to restaurant. You know, sometimes she, she would say, you never know, one day it might be just me and you, you gotta That's show right. me how to cut this meat. Chicken and oxtail. Thank you Enjoy. very much, sir. Have a great day. You too. God bless. Tony Scott dishes out hundreds of plates to hungry customers each day, but he's best known for one Caribbean specialty. My mother is Jamaican, and in our house, oxtail was king. Yes. Yeah. Oxtail stew, oxtail and dumpling. Yeah. Oxtail, oh, wow. oxtail, oxtail. My mom is Southern. And she actually mentioned it to me. I said, oxtail. And she just said it was a beef. So I've never really had it. And then when you first had it? It was delicious. And I eat it all the time now. That's the problem. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that it was the cheapest cut of meat? Now it's considered wow. a delicacy. You go to all these oh. upscale restaurants, oxtail uh, ravioli, oh. oxtail rice, all the, it's now everybody's into oxtail. I know. No, I'm scared to go in a restaurant and not oxtail. <laughs> the, right. the price is so high. Bring on the oxtail stew! <laughs> Tony frequently sells out of the succulent oxtail, and it was finally time to see and taste why. Welcome to the truck, Mr. Hall. Oh, Hunt. yeah. Oh, it smells good. It smells like Jamaica. Oh, hey, hey. This is the oxtail, oh. the famous oxtail that everybody go crazy over. Mm -hmm. And these are like the Jamaican product seasoning that we use. This have a good flavor to mm. it. Oh, wow. Tony's oxtails are seasoned with a spice mix that includes garlic powder, dried onion, paprika, black pepper, sugar, salt, and a few chef secrets. This is my product that I make. It's have like onion, it, it, um, bell pepper, um, scotch bonnet pepper. I also have a little bit of garlic in there. So this is like your own concoction? Yes. And then this is another Jamaican product they call. You have a Blue Mountain coffee? Uh, yeah. Well, they say it's the best coffee in the world. Well, right. this is the Blue Mountain product of burnt sugar. Oh, wow. And this is what we pour on it last. Give it that, that good color. Then we just mix this up. Make sure you rub it in properly. You want everything to rub into it. You know, if you take a smell of it, even right now. Oh, yeah. You see, you, you, you can smell that flavor in it and it doesn't cook. It smells, it. smells good. Right. 
He then lets the oxtails marinate overnight. Then they're added to a pot with water and slow cooked for several hours. This what it comes out to be. Oh, now we're talking. For you to taste. I came to Austin. The result, truly out of this world. You see how it fall off the bone? Mm. Oh, yeah. You know, we, we make sure we cook real tender because dental is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And you know, you go to some place, you have eating that meat and you have to be here to get it off the bone. You don't do that when you come here. Good thing Tony feels like talking. I'm too busy eating. And it doesn't stop with the oxtails. Oh, is it, Mr. Hall? That's fantastic. This is curry goat right here. Taste that. <laughs> this is the jerk pork. Oh, jerk pork. I've never had jerk pork before. Oh. And that's also oh, my. my homemade jerk sauce that I made. Whoa. Okay, this is the famous curry chicken. And this is the carrot. Oh, that's so at least I can say I had my vegetables today. Yes. Look at how tender that chicken is. Tony also serves traditional peas and rice, which brought on a wave of nostalgia. This is black bean. When you open that pot, I thought, wait a minute. Yeah. This is my mother's peas and rice. This is great. And just when I thought I'd had enough? Wait a minute, I, I, I noticed. These are beef patty. I gotta try that. Oh. That's a great crust. As a reminder of how far Tony's love for cooking has taken him. If you look up here, you'll see these little pots. Uh -huh. This pot right here is when I just started out. This is what I usually cook rice into. Wow. The reason why I keep this uh -huh. pot to show people is where Tony's Jamaican food is coming from. Mm -hmm. So what would you tell people who are thinking they've got a dream, they want to start something like you did. Who would you tell them? First, you have to motivate yourself to do it. And never give up on your dream. My mama always tell me, don't make nobody tell you you can do nothing. Tony, thank you so much. It's this a pleasure, Harley. It, it, it is nice meeting you. It feels like I'm back in Jamaica. I'm glad you have that feeling. Everything but, gonna be all right. Just a few miles from the hustle and bustle of downtown Austin is Mekon Bistro. It is a spot that's loved by locals and tourists alike for its Vietnamese comfort food. Who's the better cook uh, in the family? Um, I'm not gonna even bother asking my mom about that because 
My mom is hands down the best cook. Coi như là con tôi nó nằm nằm lại ngon nó ngon nhất. Chef Will Hyun and his siblings opened Mekon Bistro to honor their mother Anne Hang, a refugee who fled Vietnam after the fall of Saigon and working tirelessly to provide for her family in the United States. She took a chance to travel across the ocean with nothing in hand, working ever since she's been over here, working from morning to night, uh, and still provide us with a hot meal every day. When Macon first opened, Will hoped that his mom would finally stop working, but Anne had other plans. Technically, she's retired, but like I said, she she would not stay home. Anne's passion for food starting in her home country. Ah, mẹ chỉ hồi hồi khoảng mười bảy mười tám tuổi đó là đi theo mấy người ở dưới quê mình ta đi nấu đám á đám cưới á này kia nọ rồi thì thích nấu vậy thôi. In 1972, Anne married Kia Huyn. They had four children in Vietnam, and turning to cooking to help support the family. Nấu ngoài chợ bà bán á thì chỉ có khoảng hai tháng cỡ đó. Thì cũng bán nấu hủ tiếu à, nấu đồ Việt Nam thôi. This is my dad and my mom. Like right before the fall of Saigon. When the Vietnam War ended, the family was looking toward a better future in their homeland. But in 1975, the Viet Cong began to invade Saigon. Giải phóng vô thì mẹ muốn đi muốn tự do, không có muốn ở bên Việt Nam nếu muốn đi tìm tự do. Anne's husband fled the city first, Will leaving when he was just seven years old. It was scary. We left separately, me with my uncle and my mom with my three sisters that came a year later, because if you get caught, you were thrown in jail. Luckily, we made it out. We were rescued by uh, cargo boats, but uh, they rescued us. They took us to the Malaysian refugee camp. Will and his uncle secured refugee status, eventually reuniting with Will's dad in the U.S. In the years spent apart from his mother, Will began experimenting in the kitchen with a little nudge from his uncle. He told me that, you know, there's only two of us. You're going to have to do, you know, do your share. So learn to cook something. <laughs> in 1983, Anne made the journey to the U.S. with her daughters. Đi dược biên thì nó đi tàu nhỏ thì nó cũng hơi khó khăn. Nhưng mà qua được cái ấy rồi đoàn tụ gia đình thì rất mừng. Tại vì chồng con gặp đợi mặt chồng con hết. Thành ra rất là sung sướng. But adjusting to a new country as refugees was a struggle. When we came over, you know, nothing in our pockets. We, we relied on government assistance a little bit. Luckily, she's a great cook. Uh, so it, it wasn't bad for us at all. But growing up, that's how she you know, shows us that she loved us by you know, putting all that love into the food. The family moving from Houston to Louisiana, finding work in the seafood industry. But Will wasn't so happy living in a small town. When his uncle invited him to attend high school in Austin, Will said yes right away. I fell in love with Austin. The beautiful lakes, the miles of trails, the music scene. What's there not to love? <laughs> Austin's vibrant culinary scene struck a chord. After high school, Will found work in several restaurants, dreaming of being able to showcase his mom's cooking. In 2015, the entire family moving to Austin. But Anne still wasn't sure about opening a restaurant. Asked her many, many times in the past to do something like that. She's dead set against it. She said, it's just way too much work. Eventually, Anne agreed to share her recipes for just one reason, her family. Thích làm với con cái mới mới lên hai hát với con cho con. Chứ giờ lớn tuổi rồi thì cũng còn sống được bao lâu nữa. Thì là giờ cho cho con được là ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy thì hết cho con mình ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy thôi. She's, she's emotional because like, you know, she basically you know, she's doing everything for her kids. The first dish Will added to the menu, his mom's pho. So pho, you know, at a restaurant is basically how we do pho at home. Uh, when we cook pho at home, it's a big pot that's going to feed us for at least three days. Um, we have pho for breakfast, we have pho for lunch, we have pho for midtime snack, we have pho for dinner and follow at night for snack at night uh, until the pot's gone. With the help of his family, Will created several new dishes. Our menu does incorporate a lot of uh, fusion Asian dishes. Um, and that is because of the 
you know, the family business. Uh, my my mom's a cook. I cook. My sister cooks. My brother cooks. Uh, second beef dish was something that I've tried out. I consider myself a Texan. We love beef. It's a dish that my mom and I collaborated together to to put out. Basically, just food tubes of real nice tender beef that's been flashed in a wok. It's been six years since Macon Bistro opened, and Will and his mom still love working together. I admire her great. The courage it takes just to make that journey and to just stick with us no matter thick and thin. She's my hero. She really is my hero. Using food to bring younger generations closer to their heritage happens in families all across America. And it's happening here at Habesha with a husband and wife team who's using their restaurant to bring their daughters closer to their Ethiopian roots. We want more than anything else people to be familiar with not just Ethiopian food but Ethiopian culture. My name is Yine Fantu. This is my wife, Salama Bebe. We ran an Ethiopian restaurant called Habesha in Austin. When it opened in 2013, Habesha was the second Ethiopian restaurant in Austin. People stay coming in here, we give them the food, they said, where's the fork? Your hands. <laughs> Ethiopian food is eaten with injera, a fermented flatbread made with teff, a gluten-free grain. You'll see a family dining and everyone is on their phone eating and really not enjoying the, the, the event. Not you cannot here. do that in Ethiopian restaurant. You have to use your hands, you can't. Both of them. That emphasis on family is everywhere in Habesha, from the Ethiopian art and decor to Yidni and Salam's daughters, who can often be found studying at the restaurant. I think I was like around four years old when we opened, so like this is like my second home. Salam and Yidni were born and raised in different parts of Ethiopia. In the 90s, they left Africa to attend college here in the United States. Yidni immigrating to Texas, Salam to Maryland, where her family owned an Ethiopian restaurant. A chance meeting bringing them together. My dad was visiting a friend, dining at uh, her family restaurant, and she happened to be the waitress. And uh, he overheard a music playing and uh, asked her, hey, uh, where could I get the CD? And she was nice enough to, to grab the CD and hand it to him. But Yidney's dad was thinking about more than music. When he got home, he immediately gave his son a call. And he said, hey, just uh, call her and thank her for me. <laughs> <laughs> when he called me, I was like, I give it to your dad, not for you. 
and then he kept calling me out like okay I think he's not gonna give up my dad was uh, one who hooked me up to him, so. <laughs> they dated long distance before Salam moved to Texas the couple marrying in 2003 their daughters Edel and Azel are now teenagers I think we've always been around food. My mom's always cooking. For me, I love her pancakes. She makes <laughs> the best pancakes. Salam left the restaurant industry to focus on parenting, but Yidney knew his wife's heart was in cooking professionally. What I saw in her was the passion to own her own business. I really want to open restaurant, and I love the customer service and cooking. In 2012, Yidney and Salam finding the perfect location for their restaurant. Austin is a, a, a very unique town in that there is people from all walks of life. And I think part of the reason that we are successful is because of that diversity. Habesh's menu honors their Ethiopian heritage with many vegetarian dishes, from stewed yellow split peas to braised collard greens. They also serve more than a dozen dishes with beef. Texas is, uh, has a lot of people that loves meat, so we have a bigger selection of meat as well. And I think my favorite dish in that is the kutfo, or the steak tartare, when it's uh, done right. That's probably the best dish in the world. It's a ground beef and mixed with butter and spices. When the pandemic hit, Habish's popularity helped save them from closure. And I said, okay, this is it. I uh, think we're gonna fall down now. And then people, they support us. They love to be here. They send us check. They send us cards. We have a good, good community. The donations from fans kept them afloat until they figured out a to-go plan. Before COVID, takeout business was only three or 4% of our business. And overnight, we had to do 100% of our business. And by nature, Ethiopian food does not take out, so we have to figure out a way to package the food, to market the food. After laying off most employees, the couple had to work nonstop. As the to-go business began ramping up, Edel and Azel pitched in to support their parents and save their beloved second home. I would write down like the orders, like the online orders, and I would like put them in the kitchen and cleaning, washing the dishes, cutting the injera, like folding it, boxing up to the orders. They did a lot and they're part of the reason why we're still around. So I'm sorry I get a little emotional when I talk about them, but uh, yeah, they're, uh, they're incredible. They're uh, just a uh, love of my life. One of the things that we instill in them is knowing who they are, uh, where their parents came from, and learning the culture, learning the food. Salam is looking forward to a busier future at her dream restaurant. I want to uh, grow this business, and a lot of people, they never had Ethiopian food. They had Chinese food, Italian food, or Indian food. So they don't know about Ethiopian food. I'm really proud of her because like she she gets frustrated at times, but she doesn't let that like stop her. A really big inspiration to me. Whenever things get hard, you just keep going. The best part working with your partner is the fact that you're there for each other. To comfort each other when it's down and uh, to be there when your partner needs you. The best part of it, he knows what I can't do. He covered the same thing. He cannot cook. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, she can handle it. With Austin's welcoming atmosphere, it's no surprise that more chefs are putting down roots in this fast-growing city. It's everything from James Beard, award-winning chef, and taqueros, and even home cooks. The thing that makes a food scene good is different cultures meeting each other and being able to influence each other. The fact that anything is possible is what makes Austin such a cool place. One thing that rings true here in Austin, no matter your background or culture, there's room for everyone at the table.
good morning, good to see you. Welcome to The Boost, and it is story time. We are honoring the authors behind the iconic books we've read to our kids over the decades. But first, we're gonna introduce you to some incredible father-daughter duos. Meet Dad Jay and his daughter Ella. Together, they beautifully captured the journey of growing up over the course of 18 years. Jenna Bush Hager shares their sweet story. Here's my birthday. Hi. Hi. My name is Ella. Test, 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 test. Okay, let's start. And look at the other. A birthday oh ritual that began when Ella Rosenblatt was two years old. Every year, me and Dad film together. Oh, yes, for your birthday. Yeah. From the age of two to 18, Ella sat in this exact spot, answering questions from her father, Jay Rosenblatt, a filmmaker. It's so simple and yet profound. What were you hoping to do with it? I just thought that this would be a great project that if it didn't turn into a film, it would be a great archive for her. That keepsake for Ella is now a new HBO documentary, How Do You Measure a Year? which was nominated for an Academy Award. What do you want to do when you grow up? Put on makeup and eat gum. To be a good person, but not be perfect. This is the second year in a row Jay earned an Oscar nod. I like it a lot. Took a team. Jay made three other films with his daughter, but this one is his most personal. What do you want to say to your older self? Let's talk about you and me for a second. He asked Ella the same questions year after year, even braving those tween years. Our relationship has been tough this past year. Jay says yearly check-ins about their relationship and added plus. But we always make up and forgive each other in the end, so I feel pretty good about it. Part of the magic is watching his baby grow up right before his eyes. What is power? I don't know. What do you think it means? What does power mean? Power means, I don't know, feel my muscles. Power is being yourself. That takes a lot of power. What else as a father, when you watched it back, came to mind? How amazing a person she is and how much I love her. Ella. As a parent, it goes by so fast. So part of my motivation in filming her is just to hold on to it as long as you can. What would you say about who she's become? Well, I think she's become who she has always been. It's just an older version of her. She's just a wonderful being. I feel so lucky. Wow, we are that so delighted beautiful. to have Jay Rosenblatt with us, along with his daughter. She's 22 now, oh. Ella. She's in San Francisco this morning. Uh, Ella, we'll talk to you in a second. Jay, first of all, did you edit for three years through tears? Because I, <laughs> I mean, just watching that and the, all the home movies. But I mean, you asked such provocative and interesting mm -hmm. questions. You didn't, you asked questions that stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why this is so powerful. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, the questions um, are, in a way, not the important part of this film. It's, it's seeing her grow up in front of your eyes in such a short amount of time. Yeah. I thought what was interesting was you said she's actually been the same person. She's just kind of evolving. Did you notice that through thread when you looked at her answers when she was three and four and five to now, or teenage years? Well, you know, when she was really young, yeah. the answers were really funny. Yeah. <laughs> and as she gets older, you could see that she's become more socialized and she's just uh, more serious. So there is a through line of her spirit, but the responses are very different. <laughs> Ella, um, as we said, this really is a love letter mm -hmm. that your dad gave to all of us, but it's about you. What did you think when you mm -hmm. first saw the, the film? Yeah, um, it was definitely really surreal to see it. Um, I think, you know, most kids may have a few home movies, but to have this really like meticulously documented footage year to year, um, it kind of feels like, you know, my own personal time capsule in a sense. Well, I think it's so interesting because your dad asked about your relationship with yes. him and you were honest because I think that might be one of those things where you don't want to hurt his feelings if you're going through a difficult spot, but you told the truth. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a testament to our relationship, and I also think um, it really, you know, shows the authenticity of the film. Um, we were really honest with each other throughout the whole process. Ella, what did you think when you saw it all together, this final product? Did you learn anything about yourself that you didn't know? Did you view your relationship with your dad a little differently? What impact did it have to see that? Yeah, I mean, I really didn't see any of the footage till it was mostly put together, and so I hadn't remembered most of my answers even at 18. You know, it had been, at that point, I think two or three years since the most recent one and many years since the earlier ones. Um, so it was really, you know, I felt in some ways just like another audience member viewing it for the first time, and then, um, yeah, just so special that my dad put on all this work, and I was just really happy to see the final product. Hmm. Well, we know y'all can't be together for Father's Day, but do you want to just say Happy Father's Day to, <laughs> to your dad right, right now yes. on satellite? Yeah, Happy Father's Day, Dad. I love you so much. Oh, oh my gosh. Beautiful. Thank you guys so much. Thank and you said it's never too late to start. We can do it now. Yes. Start yeah, kids. that's the thing. We are like, why didn't we do this? But, Jay, you think, I mean, people are watching probably yeah. thinking, what a great yeah. idea. What advice would you give? I, I would say it's never too late yeah. because okay. you could always fill in the earlier years with photos, a montage. Uh -huh. There's lots Something. of ways around that. But mm -hmm. what's really valuable is just having this ritual to check in. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, I think that was probably the best thing that came out of wow. this. From one duo to another, this next father-daughter team is revolutionizing nursery rhymes with a little corner of YouTube that's become a huge hit. Craig Melvin shares their story as part of our Dad's Got This series. They're the children's songs taking the internet by storm. Revolutionizing how we think about nursery rhymes. Let's count by two. All thanks to this father-daughter duo who are putting representation front and center on YouTube Gracie. with Gracie's Corner. How did all of this get started? For me, it started really out of a result of the pandemic. I saw um, a lot of the content that my kids were watching. One of the things that stood out to me was like, man, there's very few to almost no, no children that look like my daughter that are portrayed on the, on the screen. Two years ago, music was the furthest thing from Javoris Hollingsworth's mind, teaching chemistry at the University of St. Thomas in Houston. I'm a musician turned scientist, now turned back musician. I grew up in the church um, and learned to play the drum and the keyboard. Javoris has since hung up his lab coat to work on the YouTube channel full time with his daughter, Gracie. It was a tough decision because I recognize the impact that I can have in the classroom, but then I also recognize the impact that this channel is having on a global scale. What sound does that letter make? His goal is to empower kids to embrace who they are while learning basic skills. Javoris leans on his wife Arlene's psychology background to make sure the messages are clear. And Gracie is the face and voice of the channel through her cartoon character. From their DIY home studio and with the help of a graphic artist, the two have put a modern spin to those nursery rhymes we all know so well. And are composing original songs as well. One of the things I love about the videos is, is you, you use one of my favorite genres, hip hop, to connect with, with kids. There's a lot of kids' songs out there, but many of them you almost want to pull your hair out. You're right. Just right. Been... You're right. <laughs> My mindset was like, okay, how can we make this fun? Make it something that a parent wouldn't mind riding in a car and listening to. Let's celebrate, let's celebrate. They even tackle hard subjects like race with songs celebrating Juneteenth and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The response has been undeniable. Gracie's Corner has racked up more than 200 million views on YouTube. cool thing to see too is that uh, not only have the kids been able to enjoy it, but also parents. For Gracie, who's now 10, the quality time with her dad is the reward. Does he ever have an idea for a song or, or video and you say, Dad, no, that, that's not, that's not Gracie. Well, mostly all the time he's at, um, <laughs> kind of like 
I'm the boss of him. She graced us with a small performance of her favorite song. Come on, baby, brush your teeth and let's brush our teeth. Come on, Gracie. A lot of people are brushing their teeth because of you. Hopefully they're not doing it too much. <laughs> For this former professor, continuing to educate and empower kids is the ultimate teaching moment. Coming up, we're getting our hands dirty, taking you into the garden. That's after the break. the boost with a look at the healing power of Mother Nature. Gotti Schwartz introduces us to a woman helping people grow through gardening. If you wanted to plant a beautiful garden, you might not pick them all in LA, but with the help of this mobile nursery called the Oasis, it might be exactly where you end up. It almost seems like she is this entrance to a secret garden that you can transport anywhere. She is just that. Um, I love the idea of the secret garden because she's very personal. Created by Barbara Lawson, the van helps her direct people to where they can meet her in the dirt. The name of her one-of-a-kind gardening therapy sessions. So you're telling me that we are going to do gardening. We are going to connect with the ground inside of a mall. Absolutely inside that mall, but not just any experience. You just wait and see. For Barbara, a certified grief counselor, the root of sharing her love of plants runs much deeper. What inspired this dream? This particular dream about uh, Meet Me in the Dirt was uh, born in pain. Um, when I was 24, I lost my mother. Normally, you can move through that process of grieving uh, naturally, but after about 20 years of not dealing with that pain, um, I went into a deep depression, and Meet Me in the Dirt was born. We joined Barbara inside her South Bay Galleria Sanctuary for a therapy session and watched her transform a table of strangers into a wellspring of well-being. I start by giving you journals because, yes, we're going to get dirty, but um, this work requires that we also do some of this work, meaning reflection. We are love. Strong, strong, intentional, intentional, sincere, sincere, sunshine, sunshine grateful, and yearning. and yearning. I'm loving all these words. So right behind you, and then take whatever time you need, there's an assortment of plants. I want you to get two babies that call your name. Exactly like my daughter. Oh, uh, okay. This looks like a crazy hair. Yeah. yeah that's cute. <laughs> no plan is perfect unless it's fake. There is absolutely scientific proven facts that show us that digging in dirt releases stress, releases anxiety, and it helps us to heal. You have your pen, you have your journal. What is this good soil getting ready to represent in your life? Think about this nursery pot. What would happen if this baby stayed in this nursery pot? Your new environment is where you're gonna allow yourself to grow and to flourish beyond where you were. Mm -hmm. So sometimes in life, things have to come against you. Press, press all around. What is it that's doing that to you? What's squeezing you on all sides? Mm. As we worked through the session, it became it obvious pressure. that the dirt symbolizes so much more. When I placed my first baby in the pot, she was leaning over and I wanted her to stand up. <laughs> and I had to check myself in that moment and say, 
It's okay for her to lean. Mm -hmm. It's okay for her to get steady over time. And it's very, very parallel to some personal things that I'm dealing with right now. So I'm trying to hold it together. <laughs> but it's deeper. When she was talking about how some of the leaves, this is the plant's way of, of shedding the toxicity. Yeah. Do you see beauty in that? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, there's beauty in the growth. There's beauty in the shedding. When you look at it knowing what the plant's doing, all of a sudden it becomes beautiful. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. It reminds you of yourself. In sharing, you actually become a very powerful person. Yes. Yes. If you're so afraid to be vulnerable, mm -hmm. when being vulnerable is actually incredible. And for an hour, we listen to the wisdom found in Mother Nature from a gardener of plants and a gardener of people. And when you're removing yourself out of that old nursery pot into your new environment, you just transition. We've connected with each other, we've shown each other love, we've added encouragement, we've made sure to tell ourselves that nothing blooms all year round. From the garden to the farm, Joe Fryer takes us to Reed's Organic Farm in New Jersey, where kids are learning valuable lessons and growing confidence. On Reed's Organic Farm in New Jersey, they're harvesting food. Mmm, good, right? While growing young minds. Beautiful. These teens live in Atlantic City, which is a mere 20 minutes away, yet feels like another world. Why do you love it so much? Because it's quiet. 78 serene acres that are home to a summer program through the Boys and Girls Club of Atlantic City. Hold the branch with one hand. The kids are learning what it takes to grow and harvest a wide range of fruits and veggies. You have to have the muscles to pull them to smile. Do you have the muscles? Yeah. Here, they're united with nature, even the pigs in the farm's animal sanctuary. They can come here and they can learn how we do things on a farm but it's so important that they know that these are things that they can take home with them and share with their families. In fact, some of the food they harvest ends up at the Boys and Girls Club. Why are these so special? Because they're organic. A lesson in nutrition in a place deemed a food desert. Atlantic City has gone 15 years without a fully operated grocery store. Amir Simmons Robinson, the eight week program is having an impact. Just ask mom. I see a huge difference in his, like his attitude, his behavior. He's a lot more patient. And for Cookie Till, the farm's co-founder, that is food for the soul. When you see it have an impact on them, how does that impact you? It just makes my heart sing. It just means that change is possible. Planting seeds in more ways than one. Joe Fryer, NBC News. Coming up, we say good night, moon, as we honor a bedtime classic. Stay with us.
to the boost. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the release of the first book from author and cartoonist Mo Willems. His work has defined children's literature, and Joe Fryer caught up with him at the Strand Bookstore right here in New York to discuss the pigeon that started it all. Can I have a glass of water? No. This year, the literary world is celebrating 20 years of the pigeon, first name the, last name Pigeon, a beloved children's book character, even if he is a little bossy. The pigeon has wants. The pigeon has needs, and the pigeon does not know the difference between the two of those things. Mo Willems is the author cartoonist who first gave voice to the pigeon in 2003 with the award-winning book, Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus. It chronicles the persistent pigeon's push to take the wheel as readers resoundingly reply, No! I was by no means assured that a book about a rat with wings talking directly to kids and making them yell no at the top of their lungs was going to be something I would get to make a career out of. What is it about the pigeon that has endured for so long, do you think? I know that for myself, I am always trying to make 49% of the book, and I want the audience to make 51%. To Willem's books are an invitation, a spark, a starting point for kids and grown-ups. I am more concerned about the play afterwards. What happens when they finish reading? Do they want to read again? Do they want to make their own stories? That is what excites me. It likely won't surprise you that Willems began his career as a writer and animator on Sesame Street before shifting to books. Does it amaze you just how many books for children there are? I think it's great because there are so many different types of children. He has written more than 70 books with characters grown in what he calls his idea garden. From the duo of Elephant and Piggy to the quiet Knuffle Bunny, a story inspired by Willem's own child, Trix. It's a very special time when a grown-up and a kid are reading together. It's very intimate. And it's an opportunity for the kid to bond with the grown-up. During the pandemic, Willems hosted Lunch Doodles. Kind of looks like an ice cream cone. More recently, he created a comedy opera with renowned soprano Renee Fleming. Opera might be the most adult thing I can think of. <laughs> In some ways, but it's similar because they yell. They have emotions, and they tell you directly how they feel. Willems also has a new pigeon book for adults, filled with pigeon wisdom, and like many of his books, a whimsical surprise. Now you have a pigeon mask. Some other thing that rewards rereading. A picture book does not get read. A novel gets read. A picture book gets read a billion times. After 20 years, the pigeon still can't drive the bus, but he, and Mo can keep taking us on some amazing adventures. For Sunday Today, Joe Fryer, New York. Up next, the story behind one of the most beloved books of all time, Good Night Moon. We are honoring the bedtime classic with the help of some very special little friends. This is a book called Good Night Moon. And this might make you sleepy. Please don't fall asleep. <gasps> when I first saw Good Night Moon and read it, I was like, wow, like what is it about this book that's captivating kids? And then I realized it's everything. It's a child's room, it's a child's brain, and it's the calming effect that words on a page can have. So powerful that Good Night Moon has sold more than 40 million copies and has been translated into 26 languages. And a little toy Ow. read around the earth. Good Night Room. And high above it. There's even a trove of parodies Good Nighting Everything from presidents to iPads. Good Night Cow jumping over the moon. And more than a few famous faces have big good night to mush night and brush. And good night to the little lady who is whispering hush. But for grown-ups, perhaps more enchanting than the book itself is the larger-than-life tale of the woman behind it, Margaret Wise Brown. 
She had a very big personality. She was very flamboyant. I think if you picture sort of an old-fashioned, shushy, authoritative children's book author, she wasn't that way at all. Instead, this New Yorker had a storied love life filled with broken engagements and forbidden romances. She came from wealth and lived lavishly. When she signed her first book contract, she spontaneously decided to buy an entire flower vendor's cart full of flowers. And she filled up her apartment with all of the flowers and then invited all of her friends over for a party. And I think that really sums up just who she was. Though Brown claims she did not especially like children, she could speak their language. With a writing style as pioneering as her spirit, her books had a childlike simplicity that was radical for the day. She believed that this was what children's books sh should be, but at the time she published it, there were many very prominent, very important people in the world of children's publishing who didn't agree with her. In fact, when Goodnight Moon was first published in the 40s, the head librarian at the New York Public Library refused to stock it. Her mandate lasted two decades, though today the book is one of the library's top checkouts. Goodnight Moon is definitely one of the most popular books probably in the history of the library, even given that it wasn't here for the first 20 years after it was published. And good night. Nice. Good job. As for Margaret Wise Brown, hers was a brilliant life cut short. At just 42, her career was flourishing and she was engaged to a Rockefeller, but she died suddenly from complications after a minor surgery. She would never know just how her work had transformed children's literature and bedtime forever. And a quiet old lady who was whispering, and in this world where everything is moving so fast and so many things change, there's a new this and a new that, sometimes it's nice to just look and go, some things are just as they always were. And that is really what Goodnight Moon is. Goodnight noises everywhere. Just ahead, the latest viral video to boost your day. Stay with us. to the boost we have one more video that is sure to make you smile check it out a mom got her family together for a vacation in mexico last week but there was one person who couldn't join them her son william he was busy with duties in the army or so she thought watch what happens while they are recording a video message for him william we're all in mexico hey, william. we wish you were here we love you very much please please come yeah. Okay. Yeah. We love you so much. Ah! Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Are you serious? <laughs> oh. Oh, oh man, great. mom getting a surprise of her life. Uh, most of the family was in on it. Uh, she was not. Oh. The two hadn't seen each other in a while. The mom not let go. That's oh, she was really missing her little boy. That is all for today. We hope we're able to start your day off with a little boost in positivity, and we are going to do it all over again tomorrow. So please join us for more of The Boost right here on Today All Day.
Hello, and thanks for joining us on Consumer Confidential. I'm Vicki Wynn with your summer guide to safety and savings. Summer is a great time to soak up the sun and enjoy the outdoors, but there are also some important safety measures to help you and your family stay safe. Barbecue season. Yes. There's a lot of things you have to consider, even just preparing your grill for the summer season. It's wild, Dylan. The National Fire Protection Agency says July is the biggest month for grilling fires. It is a serious danger. It sends four to 5,000 people to the ER every mm. year. So you just want to be safe. Number one, have a fire extinguisher on hand. You don't think about it. I don't have one. You, right? Yeah. You should have it right there by the grill because you're literally dealing with an open flame <laughs> and know how to use it. The last time you want to start reading those directions is when like an actual it, fire yes, is happening. Exactly. Three foot safety zone around the grill just make sure nothing flammable the patio furniture is pushed away and then cleaning your grill after every use is important and we'll come over here and talk about yes, some of the tools because you can I'm use. actually you know if I look at my grill there are little metal bristles I know. all over it so the experts say those metal bristle brushes get rid of them because mm -hmm. the bristles come off and they can get stuck within the food when you're cooking there's Scary. a viral TikTok going around right mm -hmm. now of I've an ER it. doctor yeah showing this little boy ate a hamburger oh, and no. got a little bristle stuck in the back oh. of his throat it took a long time for them to figure, figure out, what, out what, it was, what it was and it was really hurt him. Mm -hmm. So stick with something like this. This is a wooden grill cleaner, mm -hmm. which you know you can use. It's got the handle. You want to go low tech, just ball up some foil after the mm -hmm. grill is hot. You scrub all the little pieces off. It's also helpful for food safety, right? Because you don't want leftover mm -hmm. bits of food for the next time you're True. eating. You can also use an onion. The acids in the onion help break up really? all of those nasty grill bits. get all bits. that nasty bits. Yes, exactly. Okay. Great. Uh, Vic, let's talk about yeah. water safety. Those are always, honestly, the most awful stories that we always hear about people who have distressed swimming or drowning. Um, you got some tips. Yeah, Jacob. Actually, according to the CDC, drowning is the leading cause of accidental death among children. The leading cause. And black children, five times more likely to die than white children. So the message here and every single day around water, watch your children around water. Never assume that someone else is watching them. Always assign an adult, a sober person. If you're having a party, consider hiring a lifeguard. The other thing is get those kids into swim lessons, lessons yep. right? They're 88% less likely to drown if they have some swimming and water safety My skills. My daughter's doing it right now. Oh, how old is she? Three. Perfect. Oh, wow. You go to the YMCA, the Red Cross, or your local swim school, get them involved. The other thing is invest in a life jacket over the Floaties. So the floaties sort of give people a sense, a false, like a sense, false of sense of security. Right? That's Let's what the swim teacher was saying. So these. this is a better kind of uh, life preserver to have. Exactly. And this one, just so you can see, you can check to make sure it's actually approved by the U.S. Coast Guard. You see that little label right there? USCG USG. approved. Exactly. This okay. is going to keep them in the right position in the water as well. And if you are an adult swimming, always take a buddy or let someone know, hey, I'm going to be out here in the ocean. This is what I'm doing. This is when you can expect me to come back. That way, someone's looking out for you. And then the age old advice about if you get caught in a rip current, which can happen. Diagonal swim, right? Swim parallel to the shore. Oh, to the because shore. Because the rip current can so be as wide as 100 feet. Yeah, parallel. Diagonal, you'll be struggling. See, look, you learn something new every day. Don't yes. listen to me, listen to her. <laughs> and Thank now you, I'm fired. Bye. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, oh yeah, we're going For here. For people who we're have a here. certain amount of extra exposure, mm -hmm. this is very important. Harry, our skin is the biggest organ on our body. So if you are going out in the sun, avoid the hours of 10 to 4. That's when the sun is most intense. Wear a wide brimmed hat, cover up with clothing. And if you do want to get a little bit of sun, still slather on the SPF. You're looking at a golf ball size or the amount that would fit into a, a shot glass to cover your body. Now, here's the thing. There's so many kinds of SPF, oh. right? Broad spectrum, UVA, UVB. You want broad spectrum, and that means it's protecting against UVA, A for aging and skin cancer, mm -hmm. and UVB, B for burning. And that's not the technical term, no, but that's I know, how but I remember it. that's a good way to think about wow. it. Yes. And don't forget your eyes. Wrap around sunglasses that block 99% of the UV rays. Here's the other thing I want you to remember. Sunscreen is water resistant. It's never waterproof. And you want to look and see, is it 40 minutes? Is it 80 minutes? Set a timer on your phone just to remind yourself to reapply. That's really important. Or just do it several times. Yeah. You don't want to get if burned. If you're in and out of the water. Right, yeah. especially, or if you're sweating, because mm -hmm. that will take the sunscreen off. But you want to remember every sunburn that you get, there is research that shows that increases your risk of getting skin cancer later on in life. Once so I, I heard that, I felt guilty, because I like the sun look. Yes, you know I, mean? I know, it's we not do. Worth, it's not worth getting sick. No, not at all. All right, last but not least, let's talk about preventing bites. So important. Okay, so you want to use 
use a, an insect repellent that has at least 20% to 30% DEET. There are natural repellents out there. People say, you know, for some people it works, for others you really need the DEET. You can spray it onto your clothing as well as onto your skin. Mm -hmm. And we're not just talking about protecting you from bites from mosquitoes and ticks. Mm -hmm. For the itchy factor, you want to prevent diseases like yeah. West Nile virus, Zika, which is carried by mosquitoes, or Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Lyme disease, mm -hmm. which is carried by ticks. So make sure you use it. And you really have to do self-examination for right. ticks. Go. Check Everywhere. all the You're nooks out. and crannies. Just mm -hmm. do. Right? right. No, I said I, that well. The tick experts <laughs> that is professional say advice. it's important. Up next, if you are still planning your summer vacation, we have apps that can save you time and money. Plus, thinking about traveling with your pet, what you need to know to make your trip as smooth as possible. That's all ahead on Consumer Confidential. We're back with more Consumer Confidential. Summer is considered to be the busiest travel season. From gas prices to airline tickets, the costs can quickly add up. Check out these travel apps that can help you get the most out of your vacation without breaking the bank. <laughs> okay, so gas, flights, everything's up. Mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, what do you recommend if you're planning your trip this, this summer as okay. far as transportation? Let's go with all the apps that are going to help you save the most money. We've all heard of Expedia. They bundle all sorts of things, hotels, car rentals, airfare. So that's a great way to get a savings. Hopper is one that you can look at and they'll give you the best times to buy. But I'm going to tell you from all the interviews we've done, buy as soon as you know where yeah. you want to go. If you don't know where you want to go, skyscanner.com and airfarewatchdog.com. These are great. You sign up for alerts. You put in the airports that are closest to you. And then one or two times a week, you get an alert. You can go to Vegas for 99 bucks. Right. That might help you determine your next trip. And finally, if price is all that matters to you, yeah. you go to Kayak and you say, this is how much I'm willing to spend. This is how far I'm willing to go. And Kayak will narrow it down for you worldwide and say, hey, these are the destinations to consider. Before we go to the gas thing, yeah. I want to ask you, if you use these like third-party apps right. and you have to try to get a refund, how difficult is it? It can be difficult, very, because you're, especially if you're bundling something together. So what you want to do is use these as a price point starting and then look at the individual hotels and airlines to see, hey, does it make sense to bundle or am I better off booking directly, which would be easier to cancel. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're going to jump in a car and drive. Yes. Gas prices. Okay, so first you want to know where the cheapest gas is. So Gas Guru, Google Maps, those are places that will tell you, okay, these are the best spots to fill up. Mm -hmm. Then once you get to your spot, I want you to really get those gas station apps. They're free to sign up. I was at a BP. It was, you know, a guy across from me said, hey, I'm using this. Look, I'm paying five cents less per gallon than you are. Completely legitimate. Another one is getupside.com. That is an app that you can stack on top of the gas station app and gives you cash back. So all those pennies really add up. Okay, now, if we want to travel, mm -hmm. people, you know, it's old school, the old travel agent. Yeah. 
What, 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 as we're now in the 21st century, what do we do? So here's the thing. Travel agents are wonderful and can get you great deals on those big trips, the trips of a lifetime, or you're going international, or you and I are traveling, so we've got multiple stops, your family, my family. They help you coordinate. If you're just taking a road trip, try Road Trippers. This is a fantastic app. It really helps you to plan an entire trip and tell you how to get off the beaten path, iconic stops, landmarks, and things that you can do. AAA has one called Trip Tick, which they is They used to similar. have a, a, a physical map oh, yeah. I know. Used to, the trip tick exactly. and you go and they they mark it but now it's digital now it's all digital which is cool and Al for bicycling you can actually plan a bicycling route oh, wow. as well I mean you probably aren't going to do like the 400 mile Yellowstone yeah. the Grand Tetons but maybe you want to do something down the coast this uh -huh. is a great way uh -huh. all right we've all right. got about what two minutes left let's okay, talk let's about lodging it. really quickly okay. and hotels and what you need they're to up 30 percent year over year so Goodness. hotels are expensive Chanel okay. bundling is a great way to save but like Al was saying it can be tough to unbundle so you mm -hmm. want to be sure that's where you want to go. Okay. Hoteltonight.com will help you book last minute hotel nights. If you're not, if you don't care about the specific place you're going to go, right, you right. just need a place to stay. That's non-refundable, but you're going to get a great deal. Mm -hmm. And then finally, of course, you've got Airbnb and Verbo, which can offer really great deals, but book as far in advance as you can. I've done all three of these things. Yeah. All right, last but not least, a lot of people like to try international and they're yes. ready to fly internationally. Anything we need to know? Oh, let's talk about the oh, camping Oh, wait, the camping, first. yes. This camping. is important. Yes, yes. Everybody's camping. So the dirt is very cool. You'll find 44,000 different places really? I've never to even heard stay. Of it. There okay. will be photos and user reviews about these campsites. Hip Camp is similar, but Chanel, if you want to camp with llamas or you want to do goat yoga where you the little goats like jump on your back, Hip Camp will help you That's say, fun. you want to forage for mushrooms, they'll help you find those oh, kinds I love of campsites. That. Yes. Recreation.gov, fantastic site. We have 423 national Ooh, park sites. Nice. Not only will this give you real-time updates that's on where good. the long lines are, if there's road closures, if there's weather, it will also give you maps that you can download. Mm -hmm. So when you're out in remote areas, you don't have cell phone coverage, you you're can still lost. use the maps. That is so good. Yep. Oh, Time Shifter will help you adjust to jet lag. Okay. You plug in all your stats oh. and it'll say, hey, here's the schedule for you in this country. This is when that's you should fun. sleep. This is when you should eat. Google Translate, lifesaver, Life yeah. right? Yeah. It'll, it'll do menus for you. You can actually scan a menu and then it'll tell Wait, you what really? you need to Wait, really? I thought it was just yeah. you talk and then you just no, you can actually no. hold it up on the, onto the menu, and it will translate. Scan the wow. file. Wow. Exactly. This Super was good, helpful. Vicky. Traveling with family and friends is always fun, but sometimes it can be hard to leave your pet behind. Taking them with you, well, that can seem like a fun and simple idea, but did you know there's more to pack than just a leash and a water bowl? Here's your pet travel checklist. So first things first, we want to make sure our pets are safe when we travel. How do we do that? Yes, the number one thing is there's so many of us, 78% of Americans will travel with their pets at some point during the year. And there are 90 million U.S. households that have a pet, according wow. to the American Pet Products Association. It. Right. So as Al says, if you're traveling with your pet, it's not a vacation. Probably more like a family trip. I feel yes. the same way about traveling with kids. Not a vacation, family trip. But the first thing you want to do is take your pet to the vet at least a couple months mm. before your planned date of travel because you want to make sure all the vaccinations are up to speed and get a hold of that health record in case you're going going out of country or somewhere where they're going to ask you for a mm. rabies certification mm. or proof of vaccination. Then always have a secure collar on your pet and make sure that information is up to date. If you've changed your phone number or changed your address, you want to make sure that's current. Look up the list of emergency animal hospitals just to have it on hand. Put it in a note on your phone. The last thing you want to do is be somewhere remote and not know how to get health care for your pet. And then you think about the weather where you're traveling. Mm -hmm. Try to avoid extreme heat. And here's another thing. If you're driving with your pet, never leave them in the car. Yeah. Even it for a minute, quick. it yep. gets hot quick. Exactly. Pets die that way. Mm -hmm. Also, pet theft is a thing. Mm -hmm. If you've got one of those breeds what? that people like, yeah, oh, sure. they are not oh, above oh, yeah. stealing your pet. Absolutely. Wow. Now, so you're, you're going to get ready to travel. And just like for us, we have checklists for what we need to pack. Yeah. Same thing for your pet. Absolutely. So in addition to that secure collar, you want to bring at least one leash, if not a couple. You might be used to having your dog off leash, Bosco, running around mm -hmm. in your home environment. The last thing you want to do is go on vacation and lose your dog in the mountains yeah. of Colorado. Right. The next thing, think about their food, keep it familiar, pack enough, and also a portable water dish and a food dish. Because you're going hiking, you're going outside, right. never underestimate how much water your pet needs. Mm -hmm. 
Same thing, what goes in comes out. So bring those <laughs> compostable waste bags, yep. a litter box. And then when it comes to the medication for your pet, you might be going somewhere where there are fleas and ticks. Ask your veterinarian for some of that medicine oh. that will help keep those bugs off of your animal. And always bring their, their toys that are their favorites and mm. their familiar blankies. It just helps them to adjust. Also check yeah. the carrier, because we, we were tra traveling with Pepper and she had outgrown her carrier oh. that we had oh, originally. Wow. It was like, uh-oh, oh, there's a little squeeze tight squeeze. Oh. Very good to keep them secure too in the car. People People think just let your dog run around or your cat, whatever. They actually have these restraints and little seat belts for your pets oh with a harness. Mm -hmm. It's safer for you as the driver and for the animal. So wait, how much does it cost? Right. Like, do you have to buy a ticket? Like, I don't even know how that works. So if you are going to fly with your pet, first thing, go to the USDA's APHIS website. That stands for Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. And they actually have a great checklist for what kind of pets are allowed into the country, out of the country, kind of the requirements and a checklist there. A ferret is a pet. A pheasant is poultry, so they are oh, two no. different <laughs> categories. If you've got a pheasant that you're traveling with, you've got problems. You know what, though? Remember people were traveling with those oh, yeah. oh, yeah. 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 yeah, the service yeah. animal scam. And then what scam. do you do, leave them at security? I mean, you got to... Well, the best thing to do is drive, obviously, if you have an animal that's too big to fit into the cabin of the plane. I think most pet experts and veterinarians agree. You really don't want to fly them in cargo, especially yeah. during the summer. Anything can happen. You don't have eyes on them. Every airline, you know, has different rules, so just make sure you're aware and make sure that you test the carrier ahead of time and put little treats in there so your pet gets used to being in a carrier. Mm. If you have a dog or cat and prefer to board your pet while you're on vacation, the American Kennel Club says it's important to find the right boarding facility for your pet. Visit the kennel first in person. Ask about their immunization requirements. And while you're there, check to see if the spaces are clean, secure, and temperature controlled. And if you're not comfortable leaving your pet at a kennel, consider a family member, friend, or a professional pet sitter. If you are hiring someone, make sure you ask about their past experiences check their references, and watch how they interact with your pet. All right, coming up, a roadmap to saving this summer. We'll reveal the top deals and tell you the best time to buy. And later, we'll break down the most popular side hustles to help you earn some extra money. We're back right after this. Welcome back to Consumer Confidential. Inflation still has many Americans watching what they spend, but you don't have to skimp on summer essentials. There are some simple ways you can start saving right now. Sometimes we like to do a macro view of this. So is this going to be a summer of savings? Is it possible? Look, inflation is still certainly on yeah. everyone's minds, Hoda. We want to save. We certainly want to save during summer. So let's get started. If you want some tools, gadgets, this is the time to go to Lowe's, Home Depot, Sears to look for those items. Okay. 
Sun's out, guns out, Hoda. <laughs> guns uh, out. Guns out. Your yes. These guns, these guns. Your athletic apparel, yeah. shoes, socks, sports bras. All of your favorite athletic brands shop now. Athleta, Nike, Puma, Reebok, Adidas. They're going to have deals because people want to get outside and get Okay. Fit. You don't think about this, but first aid supplies. Oh. You get out there, you've got cuts, bruises, bug bites. This is a good time to refresh that first aid supply kit you have in your car and okay. your home. And Bath and Body Works has what they call their queen of sales, up to 75% off of lotions and potions mm -hmm. right now. Body Shop as well. Don't forget about your pets, not just the four-legged ones. Chewy has a huge blue box sale up to 50% off of pet supplies for hamsters, guinea pigs, farm animals even. So are there ways, like what's the way to save other than knowing that these are some good ideas? Those are good places to yeah. go. I want you to think about store brands, especially yeah. when it comes to sunscreen and bug repellent. Okay. Here's the thing, as long as you have the active ingredients to protect you against UVA for aging and UVB for burning, yeah. broad spectrum sunscreen, the store brands are perfectly fine. Same with repellent, look for something that has DEET. And when it comes to food, Consumer Reports is constantly doing testing. They say the quality and taste of store brands is great and you can save a lot that way. Mm -hmm. When you go to the store, look yep. for those manager markdowns, especially on meat. This is the, the items that are getting close to their best if used by mm -hmm. date. Sometimes those are 50% off and meat's a really expensive part How of your How close to budget. that? Like, it, let's say the expiration date is tomorrow. Can you go a day or two past that? Absolutely, if it says best buy. Buy, right? yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's a very tricky thing with the USDA and the FDA because it's difficult to say what is the absolute expiration date of something. Sure. Best by date, you can absolutely go over a little bit. So you can hug sure. that date that or go past it. the highest it. quality, freshest, but you can certainly still eat it. Okay. Um, your rewards programs, anywhere that you're shopping loyally, you do want to look and see if they have a pro program that gives you points. Mm -hmm. Ibotta, I-B-O-T-T-A. Is this I want another you to one of those? This app. It's another okay. one of those. Wait, say it again. I bought I B O T T A. And what, yes. if, okay, so what do I do when I get the app? You buy your groceries, you get the app, you take a picture of your receipt, and there are certain items you will get a full rebate on. Wait, we talk what? about it during Thanksgiving because often you can get a full Thanksgiving meal for free. You buy it, you take a picture, they send you a check for the full amount. Okay. Also, the grocery store apps, these can be annoying, but if you shop through them, a lot of times there are digital coupons that are only available in the app. Worth the savings. Let's get grilling. Okay, so the best time to buy a grill is towards the end mm -hmm. of December. But okay. let's say you need one now. Right. You can go to the store and see if they have floor models that are on sale. Oh, that's good. Check secondhand websites like OfferUp.com or okay. Facebook Marketplace. That's another good place. Mm -hmm. Online liquidator Overstock.com has sales on grills as well. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, you want to wait till the end of the summer if you can. Okay. And when it comes to pool toys. Remember, yeah. these aren't items that are meant to be passed on for generations. So you can go to Dollar Tree <laughs> or Dollar General and look for those items there. Arka, do we have some items that maybe we should avoid buying at this point? It sounds so counterintuitive, What should Hoda, we buy? Right. But you should avoid summer clothes and swimsuits right because now. Because why? Because they're going to go on sale yeah, in yeah. August when everybody's trying to make room for their fall inventory. But here's the thing. You're like, I need a cute dress right now for now. a summer barbecue. Try this app. Retail expert Rachel Warch says it's called Benny. B-E-N-I. Okay. It's scours all kinds of second-hand e sales okay. for brand name items for really good prices. Okay. So try that. Of course, your neighborhood thrift store, consignment store is a great place to get cute summer clothes as well. Okay, you want to wait on air conditioners. Mm. You miss the sales in May. If you can wait August and September, they'll go on sale again. Same with patio furniture. This is like the grills. Wait till the mm -hmm. end of the summer. Best deals, less selection. And finally, Amazon Prime Day for electronics. That's coming up the second week of July. Sure. Wait till back to school if you're getting a computer or a laptop. It's a good way. So we should plan ahead for next year. Next yeah. year, we're going to start buying at the right time. Okay. All right. And remember, only buy items if you can afford them. Don't go into debt just because you see a deal. And while it may be tempting to use that buy now, pay later option, don't miss any of those payments or you could face penalties. And lastly, make sure you read the return policy for every store before making any purchases. So the comment, do you want to earn some extra money? We will share the side hustles that are worth trying that are perfect for summer when Consumer Confidential returns.
Welcome back. Summer is in full swing and the season brings new opportunities to earn some extra cash. If you find yourself with some free time, consider starting a side hustle. These days, social media is filled with creative ways to boost your income, and we broke down the best ideas. Let's define side hustle first. Okay, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a job on the side of your normal main hustle, your main job, and a lot of people are doing it. Bankrate just did a survey and found 39% of Americans have some sort of side hustle, and of that, 44% of them say they're likely to keep it because of inflation and what else. The most common side hustles, delivery driving, grocery it. deliveries, mm -hmm. ride shares, also filling out online surveys, taking part in focus groups, and reselling things. You can make Whoa. that much money? You make about $810 on average. Wow. wow. Yeah. I would assume that the summer provides some unique opportunities for side hustling. Yes, Craig. So first of all, a lot of people are going to be revenge traveling this summer, right? Mm -hmm. Pets up demand. Yes. Everybody's going to be out. They can't take their pets with them. So any kind of pet sitting, dog walking. There's a service called Meowtel, which can hook you up if you're really into cats. They do a whole screening. It's a 60-day trial. But there are services in addition to just posting on your neighbor group to say, hey, I'm available. The other thing is rentals. We all know about Verbo and Airbnb mm -hmm. if you're lucky enough to have an entire house that sure. you can rent out. Swimply for pools, that's actually really taking off. People love to be able to rent a backyard pool for a birthday party or something yeah. like that. But also clothing. So there are a couple places called, uh, let's see, what, what are they? Rotate Your Closet, uh -huh. uh, Clothing Cycle, Toolery as well, where you can actually rent your own outfit. Let's say you bought some nice things for special occasions. What? You've worn them once. Yeah, I know, but apparently no, but people are doing it. A gown, that. let's say, a beautiful yeah. gown. You spend a couple hundred bucks on this gown. And or thousands of or dollars. Or thousands people of dollars, do, quite right? frankly. That's being nice. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, well, actually, no, no. That's, seriously. Back that's out. where you No, you guys are wrong. Cycle is one of them. I know. 100%. I'm curious about it myself. It's yeah. fairly new, but people are doing it. Absolutely. Multiple services, so look that Gowns, up. And then yes. finally, Al, you were talking about laundry. So if you want to drive, deliver, and pick up people's laundry, Oh, Jen Jolly, also a friend a of the idea. third hour, mm -hmm. she recommends a service called Poplin, and there's another one called Laundry Care. So a lot of these, oh, and baby equipment. This is a big one. Oh. I have not oh. thought about this. Baby Quip. So if you have cribs, yep. strollers, uh -huh. pack in place, people travel, they have their babies with them. They're not going to bring all that stuff. If you've got idea. a car big enough to rent some of those things out, oh, apparently you that. can make a fair amount of money a month doing it. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you. What are the tax implications for that? That's the main thing you want to consider. So taxes are important. Death and taxes are the only two things we can't avoid, right? Yep. So anything over $400, you will have to pay federal taxes on. So you want to really make sure that you're keeping track of your side hustle mm -hmm. income. Now, what about if you want to, maybe a lot of people, as you mentioned, rent out your house, things like that. Yeah. There are local laws and things you got to worry about. Right? Yeah, we just had a little graphic on there about laws and regulations and permits. And that is so important because in New York City, for example, if you want to do an Airbnb, you got to get it registered with the city and you have have to reside there. So it, you can't just Good. buy a bunch of different yeah. places and then rent, and them, rent out. them out. You really want to check and it's very much based on not just your state or your county, but even your municipality. When it comes to insurance and permits, well, if you're renting out a pool, you can think lots of things could happen, right? Sure. Swimply offers a million dollar policy, $10,000 if there's property damage, but you need to check with your HOA. If yeah, there are a lot, of a lot of property owners are, are pushing back on Yes, this. complaining about noise yeah. and, you know, the crowds and parking. So that can be an issue in your neighborhood you want to know before you invest in this. And of course, what's the cost of maintenance? Are you cleaning mm -hmm. these places out? Are you hiring a service? How does that cut into potential earnings? Vic, I, we just did a segment a few minutes ago uh, and earlier this morning as well on the teenage job market this summer being the hottest perhaps ever. What are some things that these prospective job holders should keep in mind, these teens? Oh, well, it's the summer of teen jobs for sure. Pretty much if you are a teenager who wants to work, there will be a job for you, whether awesome. it's in food service, in retail. Summer camps are huge. It's a little late for that right now, mm -hmm. but there may still be some opportunities. But the wages, median wage right now, about $14. That's up from $11.50 wow. back in 2019. And the summer job availability for teenagers has increased every year from uh, 2021 till now. That's our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn.
When you think Texas, you think beef, brisket, and barbecue. But here in Austin, the state's capital, there's so much more than that. We've got folks and chefs from all around the world who are putting their mark on this city's culinary scene. And in fact, the spices and traditions that pay homage to their families are making Austin a hot food scene. It's really kind of this melting pot of different people, their culture, and their food. The creativity and, and the flavor that they put into the food is really artistry, right? It's really the diversity of food. Like, you can get some of everything here. So what keeps Austin weird and tasty? We're about to find out. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Austin is home to over 1,200 food trucks in food parks just like this one. But we're here for one specific truck. We're here for Tony's Jamaican, serving up fine Caribbean fare to Austin for more than 10 years. Meet food truck owner Tony Scott and his wife Kim. From humble beginnings in Kingston, Jamaica, Tony has made Austin his home since 2003, and he has always had a passion for flavorful food. When did you start cooking? How young were you? 10. Tony's mother, Hyacinth, taught her sons how to be self-sufficient, especially in the kitchen. So you learned from mom early on? Yes. What was it about cooking that you liked? I don't know, I like food at those days. <laughs> those skills learned during childhood would help Tony define his career. For nearly a decade, he worked a small beachside business, serving jerk chicken and drinks to tourists in Jamaica. But after 9-11, tourism to the island stalled. So Tony moved to the U.S. in search of better opportunities, eventually landing in Austin. With construction booming in the state capital, Tony quickly found a job as a painter, but it was his homemade lunches that reignited an idea. You're working, you're, you bring in Jamaican food that you made, some of your friends taste and say, where'd this I, come from? I, yes, I cook my own food, you know, and they was like, oh, you should, you know, open a restaurant. And it's been 10 years. 10 years now. The 60-year-old chef opened Tony's Jamaican food truck in March of 2012 and his wife, Kim, has been one of his biggest supporters since the very beginning. What was the first meal he cooked for you? Curry chicken and rice, and he invited me over, and once I had it, I didn't want to ask for more. You know how ladies are, we try to eat a little bit, maybe the salad kind of thing, don't want them to know that we that greedy. But it was so good, I asked for seconds. So when Tony says, I want to do a food truck, your reaction? I said, a what? <laughs> I said, a food what? And I knew nothing about food trucks or however, so it was just all his idea. I just followed along. He said he wanted to do something, he had a vision. I said, okay, let's try it. Despite high praise from friends and family for his grub, Tony's business wasn't exactly booming from the start. When you first opened up, was it successful right away? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I came out here 10 o'clock in the morning and I was all here until 3 o'clock the next morning. Mm -hmm. I make $37. Wow. And you know, I was still happy when I go home and she was like, how much money do you make? And I was like, $37. And she break out laughing. <laughs> and I was like, don't worry about it. And next day I come and I make $50 something mm dollars -hmm. and the next day I make $80 something dollars and I say, okay, I'm seeing increase. Tony taking advantage of the South by Southwest crowds that flocked to Austin in early March. Shortly after the festival, his fledgling business got a big boost with a small write-up. Kim, what, what to you, what was the game changer? What, what put this place over the top? Wow. His presence and his dedication. Jerk chicken and hot sauce. Now, loyal customers are visiting this hotspot daily decked out with the colors and vibes of Jamaica. From curried chicken and goat to jerk everything, food fans walk away feeling the island love. In 2018, 
Tony laid down more permanent roots in Texas. You opened up a brick and mortar restaurant. Were you nervous about that? A little bit. It was well, a little bit. Let me, Kim, were you nervous? Oh, about yeah, that? I'm so glad you asked me that question. Yes, I was. It was something totally different and from a food truck going into a brick and mortar. I didn't come from the restaurant industry. I came from the finance side. Coming in, I was like, I was telling Tony, I said, I got this, you know, I can run this, no problem. But oh, no, 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 no. I was ringing the, the red light bell, like, hey, I need some help. It was challenging, but also it was fun. Kim now helping run the business for both locations. Family always mean a lot to restaurant. You know, sometimes she, she would say, you never know, one day it might be just me and you, you gotta That's show right. me how to cut this meat. chicken and oxtail. Thank you Enjoy. very much, sir. Have a great day. You too. God bless. Tony Scott dishes out hundreds of plates to hungry customers each day, but he's best known for one Caribbean specialty. My mother is Jamaican, and in our house, oxtail was king. Yes. Yeah. Oxtail stew, oxtail and dumpling. Yeah. Oxtail, oh, wow. oxtail, oxtail. My mom is Southern. And she actually mentioned it to me. I said, oxtail. And she just said it was a beef. So I've never really had it. And then when you first had it? It was delicious. And I eat it all the time now. That's the problem. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that it was the cheapest cut of meat? Now it's considered wow. a delicacy. You go to all these oh. upscale restaurants, oxtail uh, ravioli, oh. oxtail rice, all the, it's now everybody's into oxtail. I know. No, I'm scared to go in a restaurant and not oxtail. <laughs> right. the, the price is so high. Bring on the oxtail stew! <laughs> Tony frequently sells out of the succulent oxtail, and it was finally time to see and taste why. Welcome to the truck, Mr. Hall. Oh, Han. yeah. Oh, it smells good. It smells like Jamaica. Oh, hey, hey. This is the oxtail, oh. the famous oxtail that everybody go crazy over. Mm -hmm. And these are like the Jamaican product seasoning that we use. This have a good flavor to mm. it. Oh, wow. Tony's oxtails are seasoned with a spice mix that includes garlic powder, dried onion, paprika, black pepper, sugar, salt, and a few chef secrets. This is my product that I make. It's have like onion, it, it, um, bell pepper, um, scotch bonnet pepper. I also have a little bit of garlic in there. So this is like your own concoction? Yes. And then this is another Jamaican product they call. You have a Blue Mountain coffee? Uh, yeah. Well, they say it's the best coffee in the world. Well, right. this is the Blue Mountain product of burnt sugar. Oh, wow. And this is what we pour on it last. Give it that, that good color. Then we just mix this up. Make sure you rub it in properly. You want everything to rub into it. You know, if you take a smell of it, even right now. Oh, yeah. You see, you, you, you can smell that flavor in it and it doesn't cook. It smells, it. smells good. Right. 
He then lets the oxtails marinate overnight. Then they're added to a pot with water and slow cooked for several hours. This what it comes out to be. Oh, now we're talking. For you to taste. I came to Austin. The result, truly out of this world. You see how it fall off the bone? Mm. Oh, yeah. You know, we, we make sure we cook real tender because dental is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And you know, you go to some place, you have eating that meat and you have to be here to get it off the bone. You don't do that when you come here. Good thing Tony feels like talking. I'm too busy eating. And it doesn't stop with the oxtails. Oh, is it, Mr. Hall? That's fantastic. This is curry goat right here. Taste that. <laughs> this is the jerk pork. Oh, jerk pork. I've never had jerk pork before. Oh. And that's also oh, wow. my homemade jerk sauce mm. that I made. Whoa. OK, this is the famous curry chicken. And this is the carrot. Oh, that's so at least I can say I had my vegetables today. Yes. Look at how tender that chicken is. Tony also serves traditional peas and rice, which brought on a wave of nostalgia. This is black bean. When you open that pot, I thought, wait a minute. Yeah. This is my mother's peas and rice. This is great. And just when I thought I'd had enough? Wait a minute, I, I, I noticed. These are beef patty. I gotta try that. Oh. That's a great press. As a reminder of how far Tony's love for cooking has taken him. If you look up here, you'll see these little pots. Uh -huh. This pot right here is when I just started out. This is what I usually cook rice into. Wow. The reason why I keep this uh -huh. pot to show people is where Tony's Jamaican food is coming from. Mm -hmm. So what would you tell people who are thinking they've got a dream, they want to start something like you did. Who would you tell them? First, you have to motivate yourself to do it. And never give up on your dream. My mama always tell me, don't make nobody tell you you can do nothing. Tony, thank you so much. It's this a pleasure, Harley. It, it, it is it, nice meeting you. It feels like I'm back in Jamaica. I'm glad you have that feeling. Everything but, gonna be all right. Just a few miles from the hustle and bustle of downtown Austin is Mekon Bistro. It is a spot that's loved by locals and tourists alike for its Vietnamese comfort food. Who's the better cook uh, in the family? Um, I'm not gonna even bother asking my mom about that because 
My mom is hands down the best cook. Coi như là con tôi nó nằm nằm lại ngon nó ngon nhất. Chef Will Hyun and his siblings opened Mekon Bistro to honor their mother Anne Hang, a refugee who fled Vietnam after the fall of Saigon and working tirelessly to provide for her family in the United States. She took a chance to travel across the ocean with nothing in hand, working ever since she's been over here, working from morning to night, uh, and still provide us with a hot meal every day. When Macon first opened, Will hoped that his mom would finally stop working, but Anne had other plans. Technically, she's retired, but like I said, she she would not stay home. Anne's passion for food, starting in her home country. My mẹ chỉ hồi hồi khoảng mười bảy mười tám tuổi đó là đi theo mấy người ở dưới quê mình ta đi nấu đám á đám cưới á này kia nọ rồi thì thích nấu vậy thôi. In 1972, Anne married Kia Huyn. They had four children in Vietnam, and turning to cooking to help support the family. Nấu ngoài chợ bà bán á thì chỉ có khoảng hai tháng cỡ đó à, thì cũng bán nấu hủ tiếu à, nấu đồ Việt Nam thôi. This is my dad and my mom right right before the fall of Saigon. When the Vietnam War ended, the family was looking toward a better future in their homeland. But in 1975, the Viet Cong began to invade Saigon. Giải phóng vô thì mẹ muốn đi muốn tự do, không có muốn ở bên Việt Nam nếu muốn đi tìm tự do. Anne's husband fled the city first, Will leaving when he was just seven years old. It was scary. We left separately, me with my uncle and my mom with my three sisters that came a year later, because if you get caught, you were thrown in jail. Luckily, we made it out. We were rescued by uh, cargo boats, but uh, they rescued us. They took us to the Malaysian refugee camp. Will and his uncle secured refugee status, eventually reuniting with Will's dad in the U.S. In the years spent apart from his mother, Will began experimenting in the kitchen with a little nudge from his uncle. He told me that, you know, there's only two of us. You're going to have to do, you know, do your share. So learn to cook something. <laughs> In 1983, Anne made the journey to the U.S. with her daughters. Đi dược biên thì nó đi tàu nhỏ thì nó cũng hơi khó khăn. Nhưng mà qua được cái ấy rồi đoàn tụ gia đình thì rất mừng. Tại vì chồng con gặp đại mặt chồng con hết. Thành ra rất là sung sướng. But adjusting to a new country as refugees was a struggle. When we came over, you know, nothing in our pockets. We, we relied on government assistance a little bit. Luckily, she's a great cook. Uh, so it, it wasn't bad for us at all. But growing up, that's how she you know, shows us that she loved us by you know, putting all that love into the food. The family moving from Houston to Louisiana, finding work in the seafood industry. But Will wasn't so happy living in a small town. When his uncle invited him to attend high school in Austin, Will said yes right away. I fell in love with Austin. The beautiful lakes, the miles of trails, the music scene. What's there not to love? <laughs> Austin's vibrant culinary scene struck a chord. After high school, Will found work in several restaurants, dreaming of being able to showcase his mom's cooking. In 2015, the entire family moving to Austin. But Anne still wasn't sure about opening a restaurant. Asked her many, many times in the past to do something like that. She gets that against it. She said, it's just way too much work. Eventually, Anne agreed to share her recipes for just one reason, her family. Thích làm với con cái mới mới lên hai hát với con cho con. Chứ giờ lớn tuổi rồi thì cũng còn sống được bao lâu nữa. Thì là giờ cho cho con được là ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy thì hát cho con mình ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy thôi. She's, she's emotional because like, you know, she basically you know, she's doing everything for her kids. The first dish Will added to the menu, his mom's pho. So pho, you know, at a restaurant is basically how we do pho at home. Uh, when we cook pho at home, it's a big pot that's going to feed us for at least three days. Um, we have pho for breakfast, we have pho for lunch, we have pho for midtime snack, we have pho for dinner and follow at night for snack at night uh, until the pot's gone. With the help of his family, Will created several new dishes. Our menu does incorporate a lot of uh, fusion Asian dishes. Um, and that is because of the 
you know, the family business. Uh, my, my mom's a cook, I cook, my sister cooks, my brother cooks. Uh, second beef dish was something that I've tried out. I consider myself a Texan. We love beef. It's a dish that my mom and I collaborated together to, to put out. Basically, just cubes of real nice tender beef that's been flashed in a wok. It's been six years since Macon Bistro opened, and Will and his mom still love working together. I admire her great. The courage it takes just to make that journey and to just stick with us no matter thick and thin. She's my hero. She really is my hero. Using food to bring younger generations closer to their heritage happens in families all across America. And it's happening here at Habesha with a husband and wife team who's using their restaurant to bring their daughters closer to their Ethiopian roots. We want more than anything else people to be familiar with not just Ethiopian food but Ethiopian culture. My name is Ine Fantu. This is my wife, Salama Bebe. We ran an Ethiopian restaurant called Habesha in Austin. When it opened in 2013, Habesha was the second Ethiopian restaurant in Austin. People stay coming in here, we give them the food, they said, where's the fork? Your hands. <laughs> Ethiopian food is eaten with injera, a fermented flatbread made with teff, a gluten-free grain. You'll see a family dining and everyone is on their phone eating and really not enjoying the, the, the event. Mm, you cannot do that in Ethiopian restaurants. You have to use your hands, you can't. Both of them. That emphasis on family is everywhere in Habesha, from the Ethiopian art and decor to Yidni and Salam's daughters, who can often be found studying at the restaurant. I think I was like around four years old when we opened, so like this is like my second home. Salam and Yidni were born and raised in different parts of Ethiopia. In the 90s, they left Africa to attend college here in the United States. Yidni immigrating to Texas, Salam to Maryland, where her family owned an Ethiopian restaurant. A chance meeting bringing them together. My dad was visiting a friend, dining at uh, her family restaurant, and she happened to be the waitress. And uh, he overheard a music playing and uh, asked her, hey, uh, where could I get the CD? And she was nice enough to, to grab the CD and hand it to him. But Yidney's dad was thinking about more than music. When he got home, he immediately gave his son a call. And he said, hey, just uh, call her and thank her for me. <laughs> <laughs> when he called me, I was like, I give it to your dad, not for you. 
And then he kept calling me. I was like, okay, I think he's not going to give up. My dad was the uh, one who hooked me up. To him, so. <laughs> they dated long distance before Salam moved to Texas, the couple marrying in 2003. Their daughters, Edel and Azel, are now teenagers. I think we've always been around food. My mom's always cooking. For me, I love her pancakes. She makes <laughs> the best pancakes. Salam left the restaurant industry to focus on parenting, but Yidney knew his wife's heart was in cooking professionally. What I saw in her was the passion to own her own business. I really want to open restaurant, and I love the customer service and cooking. In 2012, Yidney and Salam finding the perfect location for their restaurant. Austin is a, a, a very unique town in that there is people from all walks of life. And I think part of the reason that we are successful is because of that diversity. Habesh's menu honors their Ethiopian heritage with many vegetarian dishes, from stewed yellow split peas to braised collard greens. They also serve more than a dozen dishes with beef. Texas is, uh, has a lot of people that loves meat, so we have a bigger selection of meat as well. And I think my favorite dish in that is the kutfo, or the steak tartare, when it's uh, done right. That's probably the best dish in the world. It's a ground beef and mixed with butter and spices. When the pandemic hit, Habish's popularity helped save them from closure. And I said, okay, this is it. I, I think we're gonna fall down now. And then people, they support us. They love to be here. They send us check. They send us cards. We have a good, good community. The donations from fans kept them afloat until they figured out a to-go plan. Before COVID, takeout business was only three or four percent of our business. And overnight, we had to do 100% of our business. And by nature, Ethiopian food does not take out, so we had to figure out a way to package the food, to market the food. After laying off most employees, the couple had to work nonstop. As the to-go business began ramping up, Edel and Azel pitched in to support their parents and save their beloved second home. I would write down like the orders, like the online orders, and I would like put them in the kitchen and cleaning, washing the dishes, cutting the injera, like folding it, boxing up to the orders. They did a lot and they're part of the reason why we're still around, so I'm sorry I get a little emotional when I talk about them, but uh, yeah, they're, uh, they're incredible. They're uh, just a uh, love of my life. One of the things that we instill in them is knowing who they are, uh, where their parents came from, and learning the culture, learning the food. Salam is looking forward to a busier future at her dream restaurant. I want to uh, grow this business, and a lot of people, they never had Ethiopian food. They had Chinese food, Italian food, or Indian food. So they don't know about Ethiopian food. I'm really proud of her because like she she gets frustrated at times, but she doesn't let that like stop her. A really big inspiration to me. Whenever things get hard, you just keep going. The best part working with your partner is the fact that you're there for each other. To comfort each other when it's down and uh, to be there when your partner needs you. The best part of it, he knows what I can't do. He covered the same thing. He cannot cook, <laughs> <laughs> so okay, she can handle it. With Austin's welcoming atmosphere, it's no surprise that more chefs are putting down roots in this fast-growing city. It's everything from James Beard, award-winning chef, and taqueros, and even home cooks. The thing that makes a food scene good is different cultures meeting each other and being able to influence each other. The fact that anything is possible is what makes Austin such a cool place. One thing that rings true here in Austin, no matter your background or culture, there's room for everyone at the table.
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to The Boost. June is Pride Month, and today we are sharing the story celebrating the LGBTQ plus community. And we start with a couple sharing their incredible journey to becoming a family. Chanel Jones has their story. In our neighborhood, our community, our friends, our family, we're just the Jennas. For partners Jenna Brookhauser, a psychologist, and Jenna Sarna, a nurse practitioner, the juggle of work and parenting keeps them busy. Watching us be moms, Watching her just step up and, and own motherhood, like it's been really I love cool. It. Yeah, it's been really cool. And they wouldn't have it any other way. The Jenna's story started 12 years ago. Back in 2011. At a Pride parade. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chicago yeah. Pride. They got married in 2015. <laughs> and before long, we're looking for ways to start a family. So we wanted to do what's called reciprocal IVF, which means that it was my embryo that she's carrying mm -hmm. and then her embryo that I was carrying. Yeah, it was just very important. That way the baby could be part of me and a part of her in any way it could be. The Jinnas introduced us to their doctor, Asima Ahmad, a fertility expert and practicing reproductive endocrinologist. How did you guys happened. find her? Through fertility centers of Illinois. The funny part is how I met them. On the day of their egg retrieval, their rooms were across <laughs> from each other and they have the same name. After three failed attempts and one miscarriage, JB and Jenna were concerned their dreams of having a family wouldn't come true. But they found ways to keep their spirits high, especially when it was time for the dreaded shots. Alexa, well, play at 100. Well, pour some like sugar on me. I never knew it was coming, and I also- Oh, you we, didn't like say one, two, three? No, no that was it what was change change every just, night. Still, for most, IVF can be a heavy financial burden. That can be one of the biggest barriers for people who might not have had coverage, like mm -hmm. you two. You think it's getting better, or is this something that we have to work on? I think it's getting better, and I'm definitely working hard on that part. We're helping families get those financial benefits to cover fertility care. But couples like the Jennas are determined to make it work. So was it worth it? The 100%. Absolutely. In July of 2021, JB gave birth to their first baby, their daughter, Bo. I thought it was an amazing journey. I mean, I felt a piece of her the whole time when I was going through it. And just watching my baby grow inside of my wife was amazing. And now it's nearly time for Jenna to deliver, this time JB's biological child. Just got into my third trimester. I remember when I was pregnant. You know, you have all these questions. I mean, those are all my thoughts right, right now. Is what, it, what is this baby going to look like? What's this personality going to be like? Mm -hmm. Through it all, the Jennas are grateful for the support from their community. There are couples who are still afraid. Um, they're afraid to, to have a child in a world where they're not sure whether that child will be accepted. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah we've we'll talked about it a lot and kind of how we'll manage it and handle it. And it's been great. Like yeah. for Mother's Day, she made both of us a Mother's Day card. But I don't think the teachers knew how meaningful that was because it was really awesome. What do you want people to take away from your journey? There's no boundaries to making a family. And it's worth it. As for the Jennas, baby number two is due in just a few short weeks. Now to a sharpshooter creating a space for the LGBTQ plus community to try something new, archery. Stephanie Goss gave it a shot. Take a look. It's kind of like when you're in a power pose in yoga, but this action of just your body and standing strong and steady in your feet is just naturally empowering. 35 year old Kendall Tishner imagines archery as a kind of meditation. You know, it's a repetitive motion and it gives you like amazing mind-body connection. She's bringing a different take to this ancient skill. How did you get into archery? I guess I tried it a couple times at summer camp, which I think is most people's first try at archery and oftentimes their last. <laughs> like mine? Yeah. <laughs> but then the pandemic hit and like a lot of us, she took aim at a new hobby. I just started to teach myself archery. So I started to kind of like post my journey of learning. A journey kind of made for TikTok. This is one of her early posts. Hi, TikTok, she writes, I can't really dance, but I can do this. Hashtag lesbian, hashtag archer. Then there was this post, dedicated to the men trying to correct her form in the comments. I had a couple overnight ones that got in total close to like 10 million views. That's um, incredible, 10 million views. Yeah, it's really, it's really incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and the majority of the comments were from people asking how they can get started themselves and what bow I recommend. The bow I was using went to a top seller on Amazon almost overnight. 
That's when Kendall, who was working as an urban planner, started thinking like an entrepreneur. Almost every website had primarily white men over dead animals as their advertisement for their boat company. So I didn't feel right recommending any of the leading American archery brands to my following, which were mostly a diverse queer audience. And there was no brand for people who were into cosplay, fantasy, who wanted to reenact the Katniss, like vibe and feel empowered and not go outside and hunt. So I saw an opportunity. So the first thing to do was design a bow. I wanted it to be perfect, and I was picky. It took me six months, trial and error. I tried about 60 different bows. Yeah. I wanted it to be like as little branding as possible on the front, all white so that it stands out in the woods. If you were outdoors, it doesn't blend in. None of this is painted. This is actually the this color is of black the wood. wood. The white is painted. Right, but the black and this. Yes. That's really great. It is the centerpiece to the archery kit she sells for her company, Wild Captives. It's not just a bow, it's a full kit that comes with everything you need to get started. So it comes with the arm guard, the quiver, arrows. An early pop-up sale at this warehouse loft in Brooklyn was a big success. Orders were coming in fast. And were you able to keep up with demand? I'm still figuring out production, and there's been a lot of things that come up that I, I didn't foresee, like people wanting it in more colors, and a lot of people, especially people who are more professional archers, want stronger bows. What does it say about our society today that an openly gay woman, young, can start a business and it can be embraced by all sorts of people? It's nice, actually. Some of the comments and messages I get like make me cry and like make it all worth it. Oh! Soon she hopes to bring people into the space for lessons. I think my favorite part about it is seeing people feel really great about themselves when they hit it. So like when they pop the balloon, seeing how happy they are and how self-assured they are in almost like an instant. Yes! In an instant, a complete change. <laughs> Just ahead, a love story that's one for the books as our Pride celebration continues. That's right after the break. Boost, Jenna Bush Hager is sharing a love story for the books. Two authors who first fell in love thanks to some very well written online dating profiles. And now their personal story lives on in their novels. I just remember thinking of all the fish in the sea, here's this guy who knows how to string sentences together in a way that is moving and lovely and funny. Wait, don't you love that that, like, the sentence structure is what sort of captivated him? I was him. like, this is the one for me if he's, if, <laughs> if it's the grammar that, uh, if it's the grammar that gets him. After their first date in 2013, Stephen Rowley and Byron Lane each knew they'd found someone special, both authors in love with writing and now each other. Byron says it's Stephen's calm nature and big heart. Stephen says it's Byron's kindness and sense of humor. But just two years after they met, Byron faced devastating news. You were diagnosed with cancer. That was a really uh, sad moment, testicular cancer. Byron had surgery to remove the tumor and thought he was in the clear. But almost five years later, Byron felt a lump in his upper thigh. 
The hard part was when it came back. During the pandemic, right? During the uh, pandemic. As a caretaker for him, like that was a really frightening moment. After surgery and three months of chemotherapy, Byron was declared cancer free. And did you know then that you wanted to marry him? Oh yeah, I learned that there are people that can come into your life who you can count on. It still shows up in the times that are the worst. Byron decided to propose, and true to their relationship, wrote his proposal and the acknowledgments of his book, A Star is Bored. And thank you to Stephen Rowley, my morning light, my nighttime star, and all the magical blue skies in between. I love us. I love you. Will you marry me? Stephen accepted instantly, then a year later accepted publicly in his own book, The Gunkel. To Byron Lane, a thousand times, yes. I'm so damn lucky to spend my life with you. Why am I the only one crying? <laughs> <laughs> it's so beautiful. Stephen and Byron got married in their hometown of Palm Springs, California. They spend most of their days writing in their house, offering advice and support. Both publish books on the same day this May, Byron's book, Big Gay Wedding, and Stephen's book, The Celebrants. Yours celebrates romantic love and family love. And mine also has a love story. There's also this great found family, friendship love. Stephen and Byron's own well-written love story has some twists and turns, but mostly, they say, it's filled with happiness. When you describe your love, how would you describe it? Stephen gets up, we have our coffee, and then he goes off to one half of the house, and I'm in the other, we're writing, and we meet again uh, for lunch, and it really is, it's a lovely life, and I feel so lucky. By the way, Stephen's book, The Celebrants, is this month's Read With Jenna pick. Turning now to a story of love, resilience, and pride. How one young person in foster care found a loving home and a forever family. Take a look. I believe that all humans are resilient, um, but I believe that growing up in foster care, I think it gives youth a different kind of resilience that isn't one that can just be created. For 21-year-old Diamond Kobolinski, being a foster youth would shape a majority of their childhood experiences. When I was first placed in the foster care system, I was around the age of two, two and a half. I um, was removed um, due to child abuse and neglect. I was in foster care for 15 years. Um, in that time, I lived in about 40 placements. The years in foster care were not easy for Diamond. I think it was an experience that I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy. There's that internal tool of battling of like, am I good enough? Like, if my own parents don't want me, you know, like, and so I think on top of that, to be, you know, a youth who identifies as LGBTQ, it, it, it's still so highly stigmatized and it did, it made finding homes difficult. There were times where, you know, I wasn't able to be me in all of my glory. Like I, I toned it back a little bit because I felt like at this point in time, I need somewhere to sleep. I need food to eat. But things would change for Diamond when they were 16 years old and Jessica and Amy Kobolinski came into their life. During our first year of marriage is when we, we were going through the process of getting licensed. We were looking at different websites that promote adoption of teenagers. We first saw Diamond, like just really just a profile online. The first time I saw it, I knew instantly that um, Diamond would be with us. I had been attending a, um, an LGBT youth organization here um, just for some support and a sense of community. Um, and Amy had been running groups um, at the organization. When Diamond walked in, <laughs> I just, I uh, leaped for joy. I just, I was just uh, bravely inspired by him. So Jessica and Amy wanted to give Diamond a forever home. I think the biggest thing for me was the fact that they were also LGBTQ. I had needed somebody who could guide me, somebody who understood, um, because that was a huge battle of mine with a lot of former families, was trying to explain who I was and how I felt. But the decision was not instantaneous for Diamond. I took a little bit of time to think about it because I had to decide, you know, am I willing to allow someone else to take care of me? Am I willing to take that risk of being hurt again? Ultimately, Diamond chose to take the leap, and their adoption became official on October 26, 2017. On adoption day, like, I cried. We all cried, and it was because we knew that it was final. Like, we knew for better or for worse, we were stuck together, and that we had made that choice. Settling into life as a family took some time. There's this myth that when you get adopted, everything's just perfect, right? Everything just falls into place. It just was a matter of us still plugging away, trying to still make the family work. 
I really had to give myself permission to fully bloom. I knew that I lived in a home where I could just be myself wholeheartedly. And in a full circle moment, Diamond is now working for Kids Crossing as an executive assistant. Kids Crossing, this is Diamond Home and Director Crawl. It's the child placement agency in Colorado Springs that certified their moms as foster parents. Kids Crossing has always been so accepting and supportive. We can't really undervalue how much belonging is a part of who we are deep down inside and you need a place to be and you need a place to be yourself. And that's already a struggle for every child in foster care. And then you add the different layers of am I gonna be pushed away from a place that felt pretty safe to be able to, to tell someone my story and, and they're gonna reject me and I'm gonna have to start over again with somebody else. In the past five years, thanks to the adoption of Diamond's little brothers, their family has gotten even bigger. I love being a big brother. You know, I tell people like, I don't think anyone in this world loves me as much as my little brothers do. We're in this together for the good, the bad, for better or worse, and nothing can, can tear that apart. We weren't forced to love each other. Um, we choose to. Yes. We are never gonna give up on Diamond. Diamond's never gonna give up on us. Mm -hmm. When we come back, get your boots ready. We're taking you line dancing right after this. Welcome back to The Boost. So what do you get when you combine country music, line dancing, and two friends who want everyone to have a good time? It's a little something called stud country. And the duo recently threw a huge party in honor of Pride Month at Lincoln Center's free festival, Summer for the City. Check it out. Almost 2,000 people gathered under the summer sky in New York City to two-step grapevine and dance the night away together. This is my Americana moment. Turn like this. <laughs> a moment created by two friends who love to dance. Hi, I'm Sean Monahan. And I'm Bailey Salisbury. And we're Stud Country. For the past two years, Sean and Bailey have built a welcoming and growing community of dancers in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York through their dance parties. We honor and support and create a space where people feel really comfortable and safe dancing as same-sex partners. It's multi-generational, it's queer, but it's inclusive, like straight people can come to. It's just like line dancing is a way for people to come together where they wouldn't have otherwise ever met each other. This is just a great way to get out there, have fun, meet some really cool people, and just have a swell time. <laughs> Both Sean and Bailey grew up dancing competitively and have been friends for nearly 20 years. After their favorite gay honky-tonk bar in L.A. closed in 2021, 
they took matters into their own hands. We kind of were forced to just figure out a place where we could do it. Um, and so that meant we were doing it in parking lots, we were doing it in, in a dance studio. Our friends started showing up and then that kind of snowballed and all these, we kind of made this new community. Now they throw three parties a week and have more than 10,000 Instagram followers. Making a queer space I think is really important. And there's something that happens once you're further along and you're no longer thinking about the choreography and you get it, you tap into this shared consciousness where the crowd moves you and you stop thinking and you surrender to the dance and it's the most beautiful thing. We're having fun. We're, up, we're, having, we're having a, a ball. blast. <laughs> So Sean and Bailey are here, plus we have some very experienced line dancers to help us out. Abdi, Annika, Bronwyn, Morgan, Sam, Ollie, Becca. Hope Ooh. I got everybody. Um, by the way, I've driven by Lincoln Center and I saw your setup. I didn't know that was you guys. I can't believe you created that like that. Are you surprised <laughs> yeah. by what you all have done? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. It's really cool, yeah. I mean, did you think it was gonna take off like that? Uh, in our dreams it would, and so we're kind of just living our dreams right now. All right, well, give us the chance. We've got our boots. We've got our hats. Yes. I'm ready. We don't Amazing. have coordination, but we have well, these we'll two things. Don't worry. Okay. All right. So All right. what are the steps? Do you know right now Jenna is watching this going, I she, can't believe this is happening. She can't believe she's missing it. Okay. So what do we do? So the first, this dance is called Give Me Shivers. It was choreographed by Brandon Zarhorsky. Okay. It's, it's Give me really shivers. popular right now. Okay. So the first eight counts, we're going to jump forward to... Three, four, five, six, six seven, seven, eight. eight. Just kind of feel your hips. Oh, that's it? Wait, wait so wait. That's yeah. it? Yeah. Jump wait, wait. forward. Are they going back and forth? This? Yeah. Or you got to circle hip eight. and then hip, around. Hip, bump, three, seven, four, eight. five. Okay, just six, shake it. Seven, got it. And, what, and this is two. open to interpretation. So you just hold for six counts your feet and you can One, groove. Two. So you yeah. can do a okay. body roll, you can move around. Whatever From you want. Here, okay. We're going to do, we're going to cross over with right. Cross, cross and right together, right? We're gonna do the same, but we're gonna do a quarter turn to the left. Okay, so we're gonna now. go oh, left girl. and quarter turn. Okay, so let's okay, sweep all that together. Okay, from the top. Is that it? No, no that's half the dance. This. Oh, no! Okay, <laughs> you said ready? You can do a body First roll. Half. Like, I have like, okay. the ability yeah. to do that. Okay, we're ready. Yes, you do. Whatever okay, kind five, you wanna do. We try five, it. Five, six, seven, eight, and jump. And left, right, left. Feel your hips and cross, cross and, and right triple. together, right? Cross and triple. You got it. Okay. All right. All right. Second half of the dance. Okay. We're waiting. Oh, that's it? We're facing the left. We're halfway done. We're gonna Okay, cross. but we may be out of time. Cross. Point. Okay, I have an idea. Cross behind, step to the top. Right, okay, y'all, let's, cross why don't you do it all together? Because we just have a couple seconds. Let's do it. Hit it. We're ready. Triple, cross, triple, Turn. cross, point, two. Stephanie! Yes, step what? Step together, step together oh, bounce, okay. bounce, bounce from the top. Jump, hip, hip, around. Y'all are so cool! For years, the beauty industry has marketed products towards specific genders and groups, but now, some gender-inclusive brands are changing the game and redefining beauty for all people. For years, the beauty industry has marketed products towards an exclusive audience. So how come you're putting lipstick on? The girls always gotta look her best. But now, gender-inclusive beauty brands are redefining beauty standards beyond the binary. When we speak about gender inclusivity um, and gender expansive identities, what we really mean by that is that anybody can express any aspect of their self as they'd like regarding gender. Laura Kraber was inspired by her experience as a parent to create We Are Fluid in 2018. I've just been so inspired by the young people who are leading a societal shift and creating a more expansive understanding of gender identity. I just felt like now was the time to create a brand that was welcoming to people of all skin tones, all gender expressions, all gender identities. Laura was on to something. 69% of Gen Z and millennials are looking for more brands that offer gender-inclusive products, according to a report from Ypulse, a youth marketing research company. Now many are turning frustration into fuel to start their own beauty brands. I was inspired to create Dragon Beauty after being a little frustrated that the beauty industry wasn't reflecting 
someone like myself as a trans woman in the marketplace. I feel like beauty really needs to match the world. The world is colorful and people come in a, an array of a spectrum and in different sizes, shapes, ethnicities, you name it. Patrick Starr created One Size to encourage kindness and expression. It's important for me to share the voices of the unseen and the unheard in my community because once upon a time, I was one of those customers. I was scared to buy makeup. I felt like I was going to be judged. I felt like no one was going to accept me. The One Size brand mission is to represent everyone through beauty. Makeup is a one size fits all. To keep up with high demand, these brands are shifting their focus to incorporate inclusivity and representation from products to marketing and beyond. We really need to champion those that are unconventional and different. I think we're all tired of seeing the same type of model again and again. I think we're living through a moment where that is really changing. and. I think in 10 years, we'll see even more change. For me, it's so important to have trans models, to have models of color, to have a workspace that reflects room that I want to be in. For these founders, personal experience led to products that are changing the world of beauty for the better. I was wanting to look in the mirror and see the woman that I felt inside. These beauty products really helped me find who I was and have always been my protective armor in facing the world. I wasn't born like this. I didn't get to wake up like this. But if I can put on a little bit of sequins and lashes and lipstick, I can really feel confident in being who I really want to be. And that's for everybody, too. Through their efforts, gender inclusive brands are redefining what beauty should be and reminding the world how beauty should make you feel. I think as people were a colorful spectrum and these products allow ourselves to really be free and match our insides to our outsides. Coming up, we've got the latest viral video to boost your day. Stay with us. back on the boost with one more video sure to make you smile. Take a look. It's been a rough week at the airline industry with all those cancellations and delays, but here's a story about a pilot who went out of his way to help a passenger in need. So it all started when a woman whose name is Veronica accidentally left her purse and her passport on the British Airways plane after she arrived in London. Mm. So Veronica and her husband flagged down another pilot just as that plane was pulling away from the jet bridge. He texted a crew member on board. They tracked down the purse. Wow. Here is the play-by-play -play wow. from Veronica's husband. And they're literally backing away. And that's Veronica's purse coming out the window no way. of the plane. No way. There's Veronica's purse. It's going to drop down. Amazing. Nice crash. No way. She's going to get her passport. What a day. That's what a day. What a day. Happy ending. Veronica got her purse back. She didn't have to stress out while she was on vacation. Oh, All good. thanks to, let's say his name, Captain Will Rowland and the British Airways crew. So congratulations to her. And that is it for today. We hope we're able to start your day with a little positivity and a boost of pride. So we will see you tomorrow with more of The Boost right here on Today All Day.
I'm Shop Today Editorial Director Adriana Brock and I know shopping trends. I seek out new and notable products so you don't have to in editor's picks. I'm fashion and beauty expert Makon Jovu and I'm bringing you industry insiders and those in the know to share all the buzzworthy products sweeping social media and influencer trends. And I'm Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post and I know trends. Each week I'm here with the must have fashion and beauty products at a price you'll like in Style Finder. This is Shop All Day Smart Solutions. Hey everyone, I'm Adriana Brock and today we are back with another episode of Shop All Day. We're bringing you our favorite solutions to everyday problems like carrying multiple grocery bags in one trip to keeping your pup hydrated on the go. And you know what to do. Scan that QR code at the corner of your screen to get instant access to all of the products on the show today. Or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we are sharing with you today. All right, if you are out in the sun enjoying those final weeks of summer, you're gonna wanna pick up this clever find. It is an umbrella hook that keeps all of your items handy, whether you're at the beach or in your backyard. We're over here sharing it on a clothing rack, but it's so cool because it's got this adjustable wraparound design, so you could fit it around a bunch of different size poles, and it comes with four hooks, so you can keep everything off the ground, whether it's your hat, your keys, or your sunglasses. It is such a genius little gadget. I love this one. And we cannot forget about our furry friends this summer. I love this dog water bottle when I'm on the go with my pup Rocco. And it's more than just a water bottle for your dog. It also has a built-in bowl that they can drink out of. It's so cool. Let me show you how it works. First, you have to unlock it. And the lock is really cool because it prevents it from spilling out when it's in your bag. You push this button right here and the water comes right out. And then it's a bowl, so your dog can drink out of it. And if they don't finish all the water, all you do is push the button again, tilt this upward, and the water goes right back in. And then you just lock it up to make sure none of the water spills out in your bag. Okay, and this next one is one of my favorite simple solutions on laundry day. It's called the Wad Free for Bed Sheets. And this little gadget makes washing and drying sheets a breeze. Nothing is worse than when you take your sheets out of the dryer and they're still damp. So the gadget attaches to each corner of your sheet to help prevent them from getting tangled, twisted, and balled up, whether you're using it in the washer or the dryer. You can use it on a fitted sheet, on a flat sheet. It's got the four tabs. You just clip it in. The one thing I will know is that the brand recommends using it on a low spin cycle to get the best results. So no more tangled sheets, no more bunched up sheets. This thing is genius. And you know when you always need an extension cord, you can't find it? This is a great one to keep handy at home, and I love it because it's actually a double-ended extension cord with a flat plug so it's flush with the wall so you don't have to worry about it damaging your furniture or hitting anything around. So you could look at it here. It's so long. It's 12 feet total. So you get six feet on either side, and at the end, you get three different outlets. So you have three outlets nearby. So if you want to use it, you could use it behind the couch, have it on each end to keep those table lamps or floor lamps on. My favorite though is using it on my nightstand. So what I do is I have one behind the bed and either side of the nightstand has three outlets nearby. And next up, we have the click and carry bag carrier. This thing is a small but mighty little helper you're gonna wanna keep in your trunk at all times. It lets you comfortably carry a bunch of bags at once and to use it, it's actually really simple. You just push down here and you twist it. Then you just load up all the bags on either side. Then you just twist it, click, and you're ready to carry. It also has an anti-slip padded handle down here so that you can fit it comfortably over your shoulder or in the palm of your hand. The brand says you can use this with 50 pounds worth of stuff. And what's really great is that if you're not using it for your groceries or those shopping trips, you can use it for sport equipment bags or those large dry cleaning pickups. And moving into the kitchen, the Kitchen Cube is an all-in-one measuring device to make cooking a little bit easier. And with this cube, you don't have to dig through the drawers for measuring spoons or measuring cups because you get 19 different cooking measurements in one genius little cube. It actually has imperial and metric system labeling too, and you could use it with liquids, grains, powders, just about anything you need to measure for cooking your favorite meals. 
The brand says it's also microwave and dishwasher safe, and it's a space saver that's gonna help you cut down on all the kitchen drawer clutter. And this next kitchen gadget you need for meal prepping, it's the Chop to Pot Cutting Board. It's a slim plastic cutting board, but when you squeeze the handle, the sides of the board actually fold up and form a chute for a chopped food to go neatly into the pan or the bowl. This is the perfect example of a simple upgrade that can make a really big difference in the kitchen. Plus, the brand says it's dishwasher safe, which we all know is a must have to make those kitchen chores easier. Okay, and last but certainly not least, if you're whipping up pasta at home, then this could be your new favorite kitchen hack. It's a microwave pasta cooker. This is perfect for the college kids going away or for a home cook looking for a simple solution. Either way, it is specially designed to cook a variety of pasta in just a few minutes in the microwave. So you don't need to wait around to boil water or hover over the stove to prevent the overflow. It's a handy little cooker that the brand says cooks pasta in just 10 minutes. So you fill it up with your pasta, then you fill it up with water and you literally just put it into the microwave. It's also long enough for everybody's favorite pasta, spaghetti. It even has a built-in strainer so that you can make your whole meal with this one little container. Let's run through the products one more time. The umbrella hook, the dog water bottle, the wad free for bed sheets, the extension cord, the bag carrier, the kitchen cube, the chop to pot cutting board, and the microwave pasta cooker. And just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. And that's it for Editor's Picks. Up next, Mako and Lobu is talking to Skylar Bouchard, who's known for teaching her audience how to create restaurant-worthy recipes at home. She'll even share one of those recipes along with her favorite product picks for the kitchen. Don't go away. Welcome back. I'm Makon Jovu, and this is Influencer Trends, where I'll be talking to industry insiders, and they'll share their favorite products and the must-have items to shop for right now. 
And don't forget the QR code in the corner of your screen. Use the camera on your smartphone and scan it to shop these products. Today, we're all about items that offer smart solutions to everyday problems, and we've got you covered with solutions in the kitchen. I'm excited today that we have food blogger Skyla Bouchard joining us. Plus, get ready because she'll be sharing a simple yet restaurant-worthy recipe that is perfect for summer. Skylar, how are you? Hi, Miko. It's so good to see you. I know. I'm so happy that you're here. And listen, I love following you on social media. You've built up quite an impressive following. Tell me about how you got your start. I honestly started a blog about reviewing restaurants when I was in New York. And from there, I taught myself how to cook. This was 10 years ago now. Wow. It evolved. And I'm just so happy to be doing what I do, which is making recipes at home. Listen, they say an overnight success takes 10 years, right? Do you feel like you finally made it at this 10 year mark? I think an overnight success definitely This is an NBC News special report. Here's Savannah Guthrie. Hi, everybody. Good morning. We're coming on the air with breaking news. The Supreme Court has just issued a pair of opinions in closely watched cases involving affirmative action in college admissions at the University of North Carolina, as well as Harvard University, and has struck down those policies as unconstitutional. I want to turn to Laura Jarrett, our senior legal correspondent. And Laura, you and I are both doing a, a version of speed read here on a very complex pair of cases, but it does seem to me um, very clear that these affirmative action programs by these two universities have been struck down. Many people thought, Laura, the court would outright overrule prior decisions that allow for affirmative action in certain conditions. And it's unclear to me that this opinion goes that far. How do you see it? That's exactly right. We have a major decision here as it relates to race and education in this country. And as you said, for decades, the court has said that you can look at race as a limited plus factor, a tip, as you, if you will, not any checking the box exercise. And here, in this case, a divided court has said the programs at Harvard and the University of North Carolina are invalid. Now, those are important because those are ones that many schools base their programs on. And so the upshot shot here for schools as they try to sort their way through what is a deeply divided court, uh, an opinion uh, spanning over 200 pages here, is to try to sort through what exactly is left. Yeah. It's clear that if a student feels that race has impacted their life in a deep and meaningful individualistic way, they could write an essay about that. And the court for a long time has said that schools can use diversity, the educational benefits of diversity, as a legitimate goal. And it does not appear, at least so far, that the court is taking that away. But to the extent that Harvard and the University of North Carolina and other schools have been going about it in a way that is not as narrowly tailored as this court believes that it should be, those programs will no longer be invalid. But I have to say, again, it's is a complicated opinion. It's going to take a while, I think, for the colleges and universities around the country to figure out what exactly is left, if anything, of their programs and how exactly they're going to have to try to now sort through um, what they can do to comply with the law going forward. But what is clear here is that the headline is those colleges and universities programs are invalid. Valid. This is a sea change. This is the first time we have seen anything like this. Absolutely. I mean, it's a scathing opinion. I mean, it, it talks about Harvard and UNC's admissions programs lacking sufficiently focused and measurable objectives, unavoidably employing race in a negative manner, involving racial, racial stereotyping, lacking a meaningful endpoint. So while we did not see that form of words, Laura, that this prior decision upholding affirmative action programs, Grutter v. Bollinger, we didn't say that is outright over ruled to your point it in what is left so if if these admissions programs which were tailored to try to comply with supreme court precedents if they don't pass muster you are left to wonder what will 
Exactly. Harvard was seen as the gold standard dating back to 1978. It was propped up as the program that actually got it right. The idea that it was taking the whole picture into account, that race, again, was just one factor in a larger, non-formulaic, holistic approach. That's what the schools always said. We're flexible. It's not a just check the box for one race and you get in. But again, it appears on this record that these conservative justices have disagreed with that. And, you know, many had wondered why they took this case in the first place if they weren't going to sort of reevaluate the law. And it seems, though, that the, the predictions had been largely correct. And based off of oral argument, the justices seemed very skeptical, in particular the chief saying, where does it end? If Grutter, which came out in 2003, said in 25 years from now, you shouldn't have to be relying on race anymore. Well, we're almost at that 25 year mark. And it appears because the schools didn't have a time limit that they were willing to commit to, that was really used as a knock against them. Absolutely. It does seem that really got in the craw of many of the justices during oral arguments when they asked these universities, OK, so when does it end? Even Grutter, this seminal Supreme Court case that upheld the use of race conscious admissions under certain circumstances, imagined that it would end, even said in 25 years, we shouldn't need this anymore. And when the universities were asked, OK, so how do you see this ending? The court was clearly not satisfied with the responses there. And that was one of the reasons why these two admissions programs failed in the court's views. They also, I read, just keep, continue to read with you, Laura, here, it says many universities have for too long wrongly concluded that the touchstone of an individual's identity is not challenges bested, skills built, or lessons learned but the color of their skin. This nation's constitutional history does not tolerate that choice. This is Chief Justice John Roberts writing the majority opinion six to three with Justices Sotomayor uh, Kagan and Judge Justice Jackson in dissent. Yeah, that's right. And you know, it's interesting because you have to start from the backdrop that the conservatives on this court have made uh, sort of their feelings about what is more colloquially known as affirmative action for a long time. And the question was always, well, how far do they want to go? Do they want to say you can't use race at all, even in an essay? That would be somewhat extraordinary. And again, at oral argument, even Justice Jackson pointed out, well, how can you strip that away from somebody's identity? How can you tell them they can't even talk about it in an essay? And it appears the court is not going that far. And so now it seems the next step there where we're going here is where people will be trying to find other ways to incorporate how race is meaningful in their lives. But again, not in the way that schools are doing it currently. It's going to be a reworking of the current system. If you want to at least explain how race is important to you, and the school wants to take that into effect as it tries to have a diverse campus uh, and, and promote that, that's not wrong. But it's the way that schools have been going about it that the justices believe violates the law. And let me turn, Laura, to Danny Savalas, also another lawyer with us who's been looking into this opinion. And, you know, you always ask uh, when you see an opinion like this, so not only what does this mean for the universities, but what does it mean for other segments of society who might use kind of race conscious hiring decisions? So employment or even the military, which has long said that having a diverse officer corps is incredibly important to troop morale and the like. How do you see this, perhaps if not in a legally binding way, but in a practical way affecting other aspects? aspects of our culture. Well, this is really fascinating because we're all digesting this 230 plus page opinion and the majority doesn't appear to explicitly strike down Grutter. And Grutter was the case that for the first time recognized that diversity could be a compelling interest that could warrant the use of race conscious admissions policies in higher education as long as they were narrowly tailored. So the issues before the court were either could the court overrule Grutter or could they simply keep Grutter and decide whether or not the university's uh, policies were narrowly tailored. So what's interesting is the majority opinion doesn't appear to strike down Grutter, but two dissenting and concurring opinions by Justice Thomas and by Sotomayor essentially say, look, the majority opinion effectively overrules Grutter. And I think there's going to be a lot of looking closely at those dissenting and concurring opinions. And at oral argument, that issue of the military came up explicitly. It is, this case will have implications for future cases that deal with this kind of uh, diversity at the military level and elsewhere. But really the narrow issue here was diversity in higher education. And the justices recognize that places like the uh, Naval Academy and West Point are somewhat different. But for today, uh, it's not entirely clear whether Grutter 
is still good law. It appears to, appears to be officially good law. In other words, diversity may still be a compelling interest, but according to at least two justices concurring and dissenting, they think Grutter is no longer good law. Well, perhaps, yeah, all but in name overruled. I think that's the suggestion. We're hearing it from the, both a concurrence and a dissent. Danny, good point there. I want to turn to Guy Charles. He's a professor at Harvard Law School. He also directs the Charles Hamilton Institute for Race and Justice. He was not involved in, in Harvard's litigation of this case. But, Professor, I, and again, nobody can read, no, not even the best speed reader can read an opinion like this, 234 pages and digest it all. But what is your take based on what you've been able to see so far? You know, I think so far all of your analyses are accurate. So what is happening here is the court doesn't seem, the majority opinion doesn't seem to be overturning Grutter, but seems to want to use uh, what at least at the time seemed like a throwaway line by Justice O'Connor, making an aspirational statement saying that this can't go on too far and we expect in 20 to 25 years that it will be over. And so the court uses that as the hook in order to say that there is no limitation and that the Constitution requires an, an endpoint. So not only is there no endpoint, but there is also no transparency. Where It's not clear what the universities are doing. So they've severely limited and said you can't separate and use race as a basis for admissions, that it has to be individual decision making. So with respect to the essay, perhaps an individual can say how they overcame a particular racial discrimination or how race uh, enabled them to overcome something in their lives. But there can be no categorical decisions made on the basis of race. So severely mm -hmm. limiting what universities can do and essentially saying to the universities, look, we're going to keep an eye on you and we don't want you to use any method to circumvent the framework that we've articulated here in this opinion. But of course, it doesn't it doesn't end in litigation whatsoever, because now universities are left to sort of say, all right, now how can we, what, what would fall within the court's reasoning here? What kinds of policies might pass muster, as opposed to if there had been a blanket overruling of the court's prior precedents, perhaps that would have been a, a more clear edict if it was just a simple, you can't consider it at all. But the court didn't do that either, Professor. Well, on, on the first read, again, one will have to read this very carefully in order to determine precisely what the court did. But on my first pass, um, it doesn't seem that the court has said an absolute blanket prohibition, but came pretty close to saying that, mm -hmm. essentially leaving the door open by saying that, look, universities can use essays um, to address how a particular individual overcame uh, a distinctive racial barrier. Uh, but it came pretty, well, the court came pretty close uh, to saying it. And also, I, I think also sent a message that it's going to keep its eye on um, admission, affirmative uh, uh, action practices w or admissions practices um, to assure that there is no back door that is being used to sneak in racial considerations. So even though the, uh, this is a typical Roberts opinion, where in many ways he doesn't effectively say outright what it is that he's doing. But I think upon a close reading, I think what we will find is that the, the, the aperture is tiny at, at most. Yeah, no question. And, and just the tone of, of some of the writing here from the Chief Justice is clear. There's contempt for these affirmative action programs. Uh, as I turn to Laura Jarrett, I'm uh, talking about um, where he, it, it, Justice Roberts says, the unclear connection between the goals that the universities seek and the means they employ are so vague, they're saying, that you can't even scrutinize them. And he says, the university's main response to these criticisms is, trust us, which it seems the court is no longer willing to do, Laura. No, and it, it hasn't been uh, for a while. And if you think about it, the entire backdrop of this is the Equal Protection Clause, which says any racial categorization is supposed to be suspect, right? No matter what it is, it's supposed to be suspect. It doesn't mean that some don't get through, but they're always supposed to be subject to what the court says is strict scrutiny, which means they have to actually have a good reason if you're going to categorize someone on the basis of their race. And here, again, the court is saying they simply went about it the wrong way. Yeah. Let me turn to our Washington correspondent, Hallie Jackson, who's with us as, now, uh, as well, getting some of this reaction. Yeah. And also, uh, you, you know, the, the public reaction and the public opinion on affirmative action. 
It's complicated, Savannah, when it gets to the public opinion piece of it. Um, and it depends kind of on what poll you look at, right? Because more than half of Americans um, think that affirmative action is necessary. About 40% say it goes too far, according to some of our NBC News polling. But if you look at breakdowns by race, according to Pew, more white and Asian Americans disapprove than Hispanic or black Americans. It, it is a bit of a complicated picture when it comes to race and education in this country. And you're starting to see that by some of the reaction here. And I would just note, too, some of the dissent in the Supreme Court opinion written by Justice Sotomayor. She writes that although progress has been slow and imperfect, race-conscious college admissions policies, in her view, has advanced the Constitution's guarantee of equality. She says that today this court stands in the way and rolls back decades of precedent and momentous progress. You are seeing that echoed already by, for example, the National Education Association saying that with this decision, the Supreme Court has reinforced barriers for black, brown, indigenous people all around the country of more inclusive schools. On the flip side of the coin, you're seeing reaction from some political candidates already, like former Vice President Mike Pence, who is applauding what the Supreme Court has done today and also taking some credit for helping to put on the court some of the justices on the more conservative end of the spectrum who were a part of this decision. He was obviously the Vice President when Donald Trump was President and nominated and the Senate confirmed the justices uh, through the more conservative justices who are on the court today. Remember that already nine states in this country have currently done what it sounds like the court is moving to do, which is ban affirmative action for public schools. California and Michigan, in briefs filed with the court, pointed out that because of those policies, they saw the number of minority students, they saw less diversity in their schools in the years after those bans were passed. You had other schools like, for example, Oklahoma and several others saying, well, we didn't actually see a difference when we outlawed affirmative action. But you were seeing, and I spoke with some, some folks this morning with the NAACP who said there is going to be a real uh, concern about diversity in classes if the Supreme Court takes Takes this step, which it appears that they've done, Savannah. All right, Hallie, thank you. And as you go through this rather thick opinion, which I have right here, just so people know what we're talking about, the fine print is right here. And many of the justices, even who are in agreement with the majority decision and the outcome here, have written concurring decisions. So perhaps highlighting other reasoning, something more for lawyers and indeed these universities and perhaps employers as well to pour over in the coming years. Let's go to our chief White House correspondent, Kristen Welker. And of course, the White House would also be watching this quite carefully. What do you hear, Kristen? Savannah, I'm told they're reviewing this decision right now. I wouldn't be surprised if we heard from President Biden about this. He's heading to New York a little bit later on today for a pair of fundraisers. But look, uh, the press secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, has been asked about this. She has stressed the fact that equity and equality is a key priority for President Biden, noting that he signed an executive order, stressing the need for diversity in the agencies here. I spoke with a source familiar with the administration's thinking in the run-up to this decision. Let me read you what that source had to say, sort of a pre-reaction, if you will, to these events, Savannah. This person saying, quote, President Biden supports making an education beyond high school accessible to all Americans. As the Biden-Harris administration has reiterated in its brief in support of the universities, the federal government has an interest in ensuring that our colleges and universities produce graduates who come from all segments of society and who are prepared to succeed and lead in an increasingly diverse nation. The Supreme Court reaffirmed this not long ago in Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin in 2016. And as the administration argued during oral arguments, the court should do so again. A little bit of a preview of what we can expect to hear in any written uh, or verbal remarks that we might get from President Biden. For President Biden, this is really a political matter as well, not just a policy matter. Savannah, we've seen that. In the wake of the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade, he, the vice president, have tried to cast this court as a so-called extremist court. I'm quoting here. So taking the opposite tact of, for example, former Vice President Mike Pence, who's touting the fact that they put some of these conservative justices on the court to make these decisions possible. We are hearing from the NAACP. I know we were just talking about that with Hallie, who says, quote, Today, the Supreme Court has bowed to the personally held beliefs of an extremist minority. We will not allow hate-inspired people in power to turn black the clock and undermine our hard 
one victory. So again, we are getting a little bit of a preview of what I think we can expect to hear from President Biden. Again, he's been ramping up his 2024 reelection campaign. He's going to some fundraisers later today. Undoubtedly, reporters are going to ask him about this, get his reaction, and I anticipate he will make this a cornerstone of his campaign message. Savannah. All right, Kristen, thank you very much. We're going to turn now to Lonnie Chen, a research fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. I, I wonder what you make of this decision. Do you feel, as many of our analysts who are just starting to digest this opinion, that in some sense, the, these earlier precedents allowing some race-based admissions policies, that it's all been but been overruled? Yeah, I, I think that they've tried to uh, to walk a fine line here. On the one on the one hand, you have, you know, in previous decisions, and, and your previous guests may have talked a little bit about this 25-year mark and and the fact that we aren't quite there, but using that general timing as a way of walking this line between saying, uh, you know, we aren't trying to throw the whole thing out. We're not saying, for example, that individuals can't refer to their own race, but at the same time, saying and making very very clear, and this is not surprising that we would see this from this court, uh, the point of view that, uh, that, that race should not be used in this way in admissions, whether with respect to private universities like Harvard or public universities like the University of North Carolina. And, and do you, um, I, this, it's interesting to me because one of our previous guests, a Harvard professor had said, you know, that Sandra Day O'Connor line in that original Grutter case where, you know, it's got to end at some point, maybe in 25 years. He said that was almost a throwaway line. Now the court is, is reading it as a requirement of that precedent, that it's got to end at some point and that these policies fail because these universities could not put a timeline on it. They couldn't say when, if ever, their goal of diversity would be achieved. Well, not, not only with respect to the timeline, I think the other issue is that the, the universities, I think the decision makes clear, were unable to articulate the, the way in which race could be used in a manner that would not run afoul of, uh, of either a legal precedent or constitutional requirement. And so, it, it, yes, I think it's interesting how that 25-year uh, marker has gone from being uh, almost a piece of dicta, almost a piece of sort of, you know, hey, this is just sort of out there, to being one of the core considerations uh, in this particular set of decisions. But what will be interesting will be the ways in which, uh, and you've noted this, universities and businesses uh, who may have known this was coming now really have to deal with the unwinding of racial preferencing, whether in admissions or to a certain respect in hiring. Uh, and, and even though that application is more limited, the implications are indeed quite far reaching. Indeed, and let's talk about those with Danielle Holly, the Dean of Howard University's Law School, a school that will have to grapple with this decision. Uh, what are your thoughts as we are just starting to digest this opinion? You know, I think it is going to be a very tough opinion to navigate for colleges and universities. Um, as of July 1st, I become the president of Mount Holyoke College. And at Mount Holyoke, we value tremendously everything about our applicants and students who attend our college and to be able to consider the whole student. While the opinion does say that applicants may write about race if it's tied to individual character, I think the issue is how do schools navigate what is the Chief Justice's advice? And I think it's going to be very difficult to do that while trying to pursue the incredibly important goal of reaping the educational benefits of diversity. Well, and you know, we have some real world examples of this. For example, California, the state schools banned affirmative action. And some of those uh, administrators have said it's been hard for them to maintain the kind of diversity that they had hoped to maintain in the absence of those policies. How do you see this playing out? Absolutely. I think that's a great point. We have some laboratories for this decision, places like California and Michigan. And what we've seen is that many colleges and universities in California and Michigan and other states have tried race neutral alternatives to affirmative action, and they've struggled tremendously to enroll black and Latino Latina students. So there is no doubt that this opinion will uh, make our colleges and universities less diverse unless we are willing 
to take on some of the tougher questions like legacy admissions, the use over dependence and use of standardized testing, et cetera. I mean, that'll be, that's where the policy discussion certainly goes from here. Um, let, let me turn back to Laura Jarrett. Stick with us, if you would, uh, to all of our panelists as we discuss this. But it is interesting because some of the oral arguments centered on the issue that our professor, our university president, just raised, which has to do with some of the other policies that have long and traditionally favored white applicants, such as parents who can donate, parents who went to that school, um, some of the particular sports that some people participate in, and how this decision as a practical matter lines up with those policies. Yeah, and it's certainly something that Justice Gorsuch was very focused on in oral argument, essentially saying, if diversity is truly your genuine goal, Harvard, then why don't you get rid of legacy? Why don't you get rid of all standardized testing, any uh, dependence on those? If you want to strip away all of those and then come to us and say, we still can't uh, achieve the racial makeup that we want, that would be one thing, but you haven't even tried. And what it suggests is that you didn't try, again, what they call race-neutral alternatives. And because you didn't try that, they sort of view the entire project as suspect. But as we're sort of sorting through this, I think it is worth pointing out what the Chief Justice is saying is allowed, because I think these particular passages are now going to be dissected at length. He says, nothing in this opinion should be construed as prohibiting universities from considering an applicant's discussion of how race affected his or her life, be it through discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise. And so I think, again, this is where sort of the meat is now going to be, and perhaps additional litigation is going to result from that particular passage. It's interesting because it underscores what I think we've all noted here is this case will not stand for an outright ban of any explicit mention of race in an applicant's uh, admission to a university, but it has been severely limited in terms of what the universities themselves can do in terms of race as they seek to get a, a composition of a student body that they consider to be racially diverse. I want to turn to Jennifer Mascott. She's a, a former law clerk for Clarence Thomas and Brett Kopp. Kavanaugh so certainly knows the inner workings. So when you look at an opinion like this, you see all these concurrences, these dissents, you know that they've grappled with the key precedent of the court. What are what are your thoughts about it? Well, thanks so much. Yes, I mean, I think today, obviously, six justices of the court have said that under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, that admissions programs cannot discriminate, cannot make admissions decisions squarely on the basis of race. As others have mentioned, the court is saying that if race has impacted your life and it's had a connection with some kind of character or quality or aspect of your background, that like any other part of your past, obviously, um, in an admissions decision can look at it, can consider it. But strategic one thing I find very interesting about this big blockbuster con law decision of the year is that uh, there are some interesting contrasts to the Dobbs decision last year that overruled Roe versus Wade. Here, there was actually a statutory basis on which the court could have found the university programs unlawful, and instead it decided to squarely take on the constitutional question. Also, in contrast to the Dobbs decision, obviously, as we know, written by Justice Alito, here the Chief Justice is writing, Harvard and UNC decisions are decided together, so the court did not decide to make narrow distinctions based on differences in those two programs, but just say that in general, this overbroad categorical approach is inconsistent with the Equal Protection Clause. But in an interesting way, they they do not here overrule past precedent in contrast to Dobbs. Maybe that's why the Chief Justice here joined uh, and wrote the majority opinion here with has six justices joining it in full, uh, because the court is saying even under its past precedent, um, under the strict scrutiny standard, which is the toughest standard on which to find something um, unconstitutional, the programs here do not um, do not measure up. Do you look at this and you, again, know the, for lack of a better phrase, of politics of the court and the way that some of the wrangling goes on behind closed doors about opinions, who's going to write the opinion, what the justices are willing to sign on to? Do you feel that had it been, let's say, an Alito who had written that opinion or a Justice Thomas, that you would have had an overt, we have overruled Grutter? Or, and, and do you consider Chief Justice's decision to be something of a compromise position? Well, it's hard to tell, as you say, obviously, because uh, you don't know the inner workings entirely. It certainly seems as though five justices of the court last year in Dobbs found uh, explicitly overruling Roe and Casey past precedent to be important enough 
that they were willing to move ahead and have that decision. And whatever the chief justice thought in contrast with maintaining consistency with past precedent was not enough to peel away votes and take the majority uh, reasoning in that case. In contrast here, I think probably um, the justices, I would imagine, Thought, thought that this opinion was strong and clear enough and 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 uh, strong enough on the broad brushstrokes of affirmative action and saying race can't categorically be considered just as its own independent factor, that everybody felt this was something they could join. It's interesting, Justice Thomas, though, here does write separately, as he often does to explain how this decision's not just consistent or not with precedent, but it's consistent with the original understanding of the 14th Amendment, um, how folks at the time would have thought this amendment would have been carried out. And then just Justice Kavanaugh writes separately to explain how this opinion is consistent with past precedent. So perhaps uh, behind the scenes, his vote was also um, thoughtfully considering here how the ruling today was going to be consistent with what the court's done in the past. Jennifer Mascott, we're talking about your two former bosses, having clerked for Justice Thomas and Justice Kavanaugh. Great to have your perspective, and we'll continue to check in with you. But for the moment, I want to go to NBC's Antonia Hilton, who's on the campus of Harvard University. And Antonia, I, I imagine students are just getting this news as we are, but have you heard any reaction so far? Well, Savannah, people woke up this morning and were ready for this. Students knew this was coming. In fact, they've been preparing for this moment for years. They knew from the earliest stages of this lawsuit that it was going to wind its way up to the Supreme Court and that very likely this was going to be the result. It still feels like a gut punch. That's the kind of language I'm hearing from students that I've been talking to this morning, that they're devastated, they're distressed, uh, not really for themselves, but more for the generations of students uh, coming up behind them. For many of the minority students, not just black students, but for Latino students, uh, Native American students, Native Hawaiian students who come from communities that have historically been very underrepresented at Harvard and schools like Harvard, they're particularly worried about kids like them trying to get access to these schools in the future. And they often point to California as an example that's fueling those anxieties. And that's because more than two decades ago, what we saw happen in California's UC system is that when they did away with affirmative action, minority enrollment in their elite public universities there fell by about 50 percent. Uh, those were very devastating numbers for the minorities on campus there, for professors uh, who were teaching courses and trying to support those students uh, who continued to study the ramifications of all of that. And the university system there has tried different alternatives. They've tried to recruit students of color from different communities across California, uh, create programs and pipelines. But what they found is that they could never quite bring themselves back up to the level of diversity that they would like to see. And that's what they're concerned is going to happen here on this campus already this spring. So really just a couple weeks ago when students around the country, around the world, found out their acceptances to Harvard, we already saw those numbers tick down a bit. So the numbers of black students admitted, uh, Latino students, Native Hawaiian and Native American students went down by just a bit. And so there's concerns concern here that that's only going to get worse now. For faculty, for administrators, they have also been planning sort of behind closed doors for this moment. Moment. Mm. And they're looking at alternatives. It's part of the reason why we see a lot of schools moving away right now from the SAT and ACT from standardized tests. They believe that that's part of what has limited minority access and perhaps removing that will be a roadblock that allows them to continue fostering diversity. There are a lot of conversations about legacy admissions and the way that pot potentially limiting that or doing away with it would allow them to make more spent, uh, space for diverse uh, students. But the concern, again, is, you know, how do you pick up the pieces? How do you look for different opportunities and windows that are going to be legal through this opinion? And I think that's going to take days, uh, really months, for these schools to process. And certainly the vast majority of students are just worried that Harvard is going to look a bit more like it did many decades ago when the school was much more explicitly uh, barring access, not just to minorities, but also to women. And so, you know, there's nerves right now about the campus that those students, those kids, have come to love uh, and celebrate, a school that has been very open about the fact that it cherishes diversity, it cherishes that kind of learning and that kind of access, uh, and, and what they're going to do to maintain that culture going forward. Yeah. Uh, there's a bit of a kind of a grieving right now, and, and what are we going to do now is the major question. It's a complicated question, no question about it. Antonia Hilton, thank you so much. I've, the First Circuit, which had looked at this Harvard case, uh, found that it also resulted in fewer admissions of Asian American students, and the court in its decision today says college admissions are zero 
zero sum and a benefit provided to some applicants but not to others necessarily advantages the former at the expense of the latter. And as I turn to former federal prosecutor, NBC legal analyst Carol Lamb, it, it seems that what the court is saying is we need to get out of this business of judging students based on race and try to get back to a more merit-based system, uh, obviously a question that one can debate, but that seems to be the clear thrust of this opinion. Yeah, there's no question that the court is, that it just, it flat out says, it finds, it finds race for race, uh, race purposes alone just to be uh, not a, an acceptable method of choosing your students under the Constitution. But I think what's important to point out here, and I think admissions directors across the country would say, you know, that it's important to recognize that it, the point of admission is only one point in a whole cycle of efforts that universities make to bring a diverse student body to their class. And um, what that means is recruitment and financial aid are, and support after a person is admitted to the class are also very important steps in ensuring that students have access and that students benefit from a diverse student population. So it's very important that colleges and universities going forward really study this opinion and really take the advice of their counselors with respect to what this opinion says so that they are not they are not stepping away from recruitment and financial aid efforts where they don't have to that that they don't there isn't a chilling effect that or a pall that's put on those kinds of programs which are so important to ensuring that a diverse student body does come to the university. All right, Carol, stand by there. I want to turn back to Kristen Walker at the White House. And uh, Kristen, you've got new reaction coming in. Savannah, I've got new reaction from former President Trump from his campaign. A spokesperson writing, quote, President Donald Trump made today's historic decision to end the racist college admissions process possible because he delivered on his promise to appoint constitutionalist justices. America is a better nation as a result of the historic rulings led by Donald Trump's three Supreme Court nominees, underscoring that this is the type of language, Savannah, that again, we heard from his former vice president, Mike Pence, as a political matter in a primary election season. What you're seeing is a lot of the Republican candidates really praising this decision. We are still waiting for reaction from the White House. They are still reviewing this for that very reason that you say, Savannah, because this is a very complicated ruling. They want to make sure that their reaction, I am told, is accurate to what is actually in the page of this decision. But again, as a political matter, the tone that we have seen from this president, who has already out, been out on the campaign trail, ramping up his reelection campaign, has been one of campaigning against some of what this court has done so far. And so the question becomes, how will that, how will this decision fit into that broader narrative that we've seen from President Biden? Of course, in a general election, the vote of voters of color is going to be critical for whoever wins the White House. And so the language around this ruling, Savannah, I think is going to be a key feature. Well, we've seen certainly how a Supreme Court decision can uh, factor greatly into the elections that then follow it. We saw it with the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe versus Wade. But when you look at public opinion for affirmative action, where is the public on that? Is it a clear cut uh, case for either side here? Um, um, who will receive if a, a political benefit, if any, by a decision like this? Well, if you put up some of the latest polling that we have, Savannah, it is quite split. Now, in some cases, polling and support for affirmative action goes as high as 63%. Um, but in other polls, it's more narrowly divided. And so I think even that becomes a very complicated question. And it's how the polling is worded. Are you talking about affirmative action? Are you talking about preferences for voters uh, of color? And so I think that that is how, uh, you know, this becomes a very gray area. But again, Savannah, I think as a political matter, I think you're going to see this fit. And there you see that polling 53% say that we still need quotas, 42% say it goes too far. So you still see there a majority of voters saying, yes, we think affirmative action is 
a good thing. You see that with Roe v. Wade as well, by the way, Savannah, and that is why I think this president has leaned so heavily into campaigning against the decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. So again, the administration reviewing this decision, Savannah. All right, let's turn back to Laura Jarrett. It's interesting as we read through the opinion, Laura, there are also areas that it seems the Chief Justice wanted to exempt from this opinion. One of one, one of them we, we talked about earlier, which is it had come up in oral arguments quite a bit, which is the military. Whether this decision in any way affects the military, and there's a footnote in, in Robert's opinion, he says um, there's that no military academy is a party to these cases. None of the courts below address the propriety of race-based admission systems in that context. It does not address the issue in light of the potentially distinct interests that military academies may present. Can you flesh that out for us, why he would have taken pains to make this point? Yeah, he realizes he may be opening a can of worms uh, if he was to go that far. Certainly, the military filed a friend of the court brief saying, look, diversity is important to us. It's important in terms of how we keep our troops safe, um, in terms of leadership. Uh, and so it appears, again, that he was trying to cabinet in a certain respect. But again, the question is, is that a meaningful difference that's going to be able to be effectuated in a practical sense now on the ground, or is it just going to lead to further litigation? And to pick up on Kristen's point, you know, it does strike me what's different about a, a opinion that is as divided uh, and as significant as this is that it's not an on or off switch, right? When the when the court took the enormous step of overturning Roe versus Wade, uh, it really was a, a meaningful sort of uh, light bulb, if you will, that the court had had done something it had never done before. It would be a new day. This is going to take a while, I think, to really see the full effects of it, in particular because of the way that the majority of the court has gone after the programs at Harvard uh, and UNC in such a direct way, saying that they engaged in stereotyping. Remember, the allegation here was that the schools had actively discriminated against Asian American applicants uh, in a way that uh, it was quite stark and also favored black and Latino students. And it may not be the case that every school um, on you know the same type of record uh, could be found at doing that, but they at least believe that Harvard and UNC did. And, and also, Savannah, this point about a meaningful time limit. The, the court seems very consumed by the idea that the schools simply were not willing to commit to an expiration date on the use of race. And they're, they're really honing in on, on that in particular. Again, maybe a different case would have a different outcome uh, if schools had tried to limit it in some way. But on this record, the case has not. It will be interesting to see how college admissions programs try to divine what is in this opinion, see if they try to keep any aspect of race conscious admissions and make them comply with this decision or just throw it out entirely and, and try to achieve diversity in another way. I want to turn to Danielle Hawley. She's dean of the Howard University School of Law uh, for the moment. I think you said you're going to Holyoke University soon, but in any event, you'll be involved in admissions. And uh, I mean, what's your take on that question? W would you try to persist in, in having race be a factor in admissions if you could comply with the, the letter of this decision today? Or do you feel like this will be so intimidating that you'll have to go in a different direction altogether to achieve diversity? You know, what we know is that racial and ethnic diversity is an incredibly important part of what we do. And I think colleges and universities all over the country who value racial and ethnic diversity will, first of all, make that a statement. This is an important priority for us. We've seen colleges and universities already coming out and saying that. And I think considering race is a very broad spectrum and includes things like completely holistic review, allowing students to talk to us about who they are and the life circumstances that they've had up to this point. And so by the Supreme Court not completely overruling Grutter, what it does is it gives colleges and universities an opportunity to study this opinion, to follow the law, but to also also continue to pursue the very important goal of the educational benefits of diversity. I would say I think one of the strongest opinions today was Justice Jackson in dissent in the UNC case in which she says the majority has a let them eat cake obliviousness because declaring
even from the bench, that colorblindness is everything doesn't mean that race doesn't matter in real life. And I think what most colleges and university admissions officers know is that race makes a big difference in the lives of students and how they come to the point of their application. And we want to be able to consider students on a realistic basis, considering their real life experiences. Thank you so much. I want to turn now to Guy Charles, who is a professor of law at Harvard Law School, should mention not again involved in the litigation of this case. But, you know, taking a step back here um, to pick up on where the conversation was headed, it really, these are these big moments in our history where we're kind of grappling with what does the decision Brown versus Board of Education, which outlawed segregation in schools, what does that mean? What's the real legacy of it? And when you when you go back that far and then you go to the, the Bakke case in 1974, eight, I think, that allowed the first race conscious admissions. Where do you see that on the spectrum? Look, uh, you're right at the beginning to say that this is a watershed moment. We have the most diverse country that we've ever had. We have a legacy of slavery, of subordination, of discrimination, and we're trying to figure out how to deal with that. The thing about this case and the reason why it's a watershed, it's because it takes one tool off the table effectively, and it sends a very strong message to the rest of our society. It limits how we can think about and address the problem and the history of racial discrimination. It limits how we can address the problem of underfunding of schools and education. It limits how we can address the problem that racial minorities and people of color um, sometimes uh, get the short end of the stick. Uh, so it is a momentous uh, decision. It is like one of the past decisions that, we, that you have talked about. Uh, it interprets both the Constitution and an important federal statute, Title, title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which its purpose was to try to reset and to provide equality in a country that did not know it. Right. So this is an important moment for the country and for all of us to grapple with where do we go from here? How do we think about the question of racial equality? How do we assure that everyone has the same set of life chances? And that's a difficult question, but that's a question that we have to grapple with. No question about that. Uh, Professor, thank you so much. I want to turn to NBC legal analyst Danny Savalos. I mean, the thing about these programs is that there are winners and there are losers. And it seems like the court is saying, we just want to get out of this business, this race business altogether. But of course, that raises the practical question of whether you're you're, you're ever out of that business in terms of the admissions tests that people are are required to take and some schools are saying okay maybe we'll put those aside about some of the policies where students of alumni get a leg up or students whose parents donate get a leg up so y y you see a decision that's grappling with this the fact that you do have winners and losers the Asian Americans who said hey we were discriminated against by these policies and the court agreeing with them today and then on the other side you have people who say look th this history of our country has subordinated African Americans and other minority groups and we have to rectify those wrongs and here the court is once again stepping into these incredibly complicated uh, legal waters it's interesting, too, because remedying past discrimination is no longer a reason for uh, race-conscious admissions policies. It hasn't been since Grutter. Grutter narrowed the issue to only diversity, diversity being a compelling interest, and that was back in 2003, that would warrant race-conscious race admissions. And in a sense, the court has been whittling away at its own case law, Grutter, ever since that case was decided. I mean, essentially, uh, with each successive case, the court said, well, uh, you can consider race, but this university is considering it too much. And then this university is still considering it too much. And now you got to an argument where the universities were essentially arguing uh, just justices, we barely use race in our admissions process, but it's still really, really, really important. So in a sense, uh, Grutter, Baki, uh, they have been on the ropes for a long time. They actually appear to be still good law. It's just that the court has decided that these particular universities, their admissions policies uh, violate the, uh, or fail to satisfy strict scrutiny. In other mm -hmm. words, they are not narrowly tailored enough to achieve this compelling interest. But it appears that diversity is still a compelling interest. And I should add also that it is not diversity, uh, racial diversity that Grutter authorizes. 
It's overall diversity. It's never been just racial diversity, which makes this more complicated. If universities Absolutely. want to achieve general diversity on campuses, overall diversity, uh, can they use race conscious decisions to achieve that overall diversity? And then another question that no one seemed to ever satisfactorily answer on either side is when does it end? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you heard in the oral argument some of the justices openly scornful of this idea of diversity. I think it was Justice Thomas uh, who said, I don't, I'm not sure I even know what that means, what this, what this phrase means. Um, let me turn to Laura Jarrett as we start to close our coverage here. I mean, it, it, following up on what Danny just said, I mean, if it's a kind of an erosion over time um, of some of these policies and these precedents, if not an outright overruling of them, is it death by a thousand cuts? I, I certainly think that's what the dissent feels like by Justice Sotomayor, Justice Jackson, Justice Kagan. Uh, certainly sort of you hear that type of argument being made, and that's why it'll be so interesting to see what exactly the court does tomorrow, its final day of this momentous term, as it still faces some very significant decisions left Savannah. We have the fate of the president's student loan forgiveness program, uh, his plan to wipe out about $400 million of student loans uh, for borrowers across the country. We'll see what the court does there. It'll be interesting to see. You have six red states that have sued trying to keep that program on hold. It's been blocked in the courts for a while now. The Supreme Court will have the final say on whether, in fact, that program uh, is legal and can go through, whether he had the authority to do something that bold. And then we also have an interesting case. It's really a sequel of what happened five years ago. It's about a wedding website designer who hasn't made a single website yet, but she wants to only make them for straight couples. She doesn't want to make websites for gay couples. And the question there is, she can she do that under a state law that says if you have a public accommodation, you have to be open to all. So we'll wait to see what happens there tomorrow. The key First Amendment case. So once again, and the court waiting till the very closing days of its term to issue some landmark rulings. And we got a watershed today in terms of affirmative action. We'll continue to digest the story. Laura, thank you to you. Thank you to all of our correspondents and guests today. We'll have much more over on our streaming channel, NBC News Now, tonight on Nightly News. I'm Savannah Guthrie. This has been an NBC News special report. Weekend, it is June the 29th. This is today. Stranded, growing lines and frustration at the nation's airports with more than 30,000 cancellations and delays this week. We just want to go home. Severe weather and staffing shortages leading to a major backlog. This morning, inside the airlines race to catch up before what is expected to be the busiest travel day in years.